The information presented in this video may be extremely toxic to deceptive governments and lying lawyers. It should not be viewed by anyone who is happy and comfortable with their status quo or those who think questioning the government is immoral. The information presented herein is not the legal advice of a lawyer and thus is not flavored with the stench normally associated with such words. Super concentrated truth can harm those accustomed to only lies. Any similarity between the ideas expressed herein and the wise teachings of Jesus Christ is merely due to truth being immutable and unchanging. Nothing is coincidence when the spirit is active. When those with eyes can see and hear, and those with ears can hear and see, because they are working together, the deceivers will be bound by their own words, and the kingdom of God is at hand. So you're a Canadian? Yep. So the new go your government generally, do you trust it? No, I never trust politicians. Do you believe that they lie to you? Uh, I think for the most part, yeah, they don't tell the truth or the full story. Do you have a driver's license? Yes. Did you read the Motor Vehicle Act before you got your license, after, or have you never even read it? Does that include the test that you take? Yeah. Your driver's test? No, just the Motor Vehicle Act. No. Never read it. What makes you think you actually need a license if you've never read that act? Good and question. you know the government lies. Good question. That's a good question. Did you register your child with the government? Yes. Did you feel that you were obliged to register your little boy? Yep. Are you aware that you actually you got a beautiful little baby actually <laughs> this is what I found out I've been studying the law you're not obliged to register your child right if you do at, at that point in time you're creating a legal entity just like any of these businesses you're associating that legal entity with your offspring and then you abandon ownership of it the government seizes it under the laws of maritime salvage it becomes their chattel property when they come to remove a child they're not removing the living breathing human being they're acting on that legal entity and you can disassociate it at any time do you think that's a little bit sneaky on their part i think governments are always sneaky you know what my question is it takes seven years or ten years to become a doctor. It takes takes the same amount to become a lawyer. You want to be a scientist, you have to go to university. You want to become an electrician, you have to do electrical training and you have to do on-the-job training. What do you have to do to become a politician? That's my question for you. What training do you have to have? You have to have a big mouth. That's it. Right? Uh-oh, he's right. We're in trouble. Thank you for your time. Yeah. But this really seems to me like a spectacle, right? I mean, you've already dragged somebody away, but now there's this presence, right? This can shut the whole streets down. I live on the other side, and i got to walk blocks around to get through. Stick around, because we're going to be breaking... I know, but I don't understand why you've been here for hours. I know, it's... Can I borrow a couple of these barriers? I think they could be very... You're supposed to have a red light that goes on here. That is not working. Maybe my battery's dead. Let me have a look and see. No. What are for? It doesn't work. It doesn't. Can I ask you a question on camera? Anyways, two quick questions. One. I can't believe you've been holding that up for a while. Fairweather. How come some of you guys have numbers? Other of you have. Our Fairweather. Have, have really your names. Fairweather. This is my community service. This is no, but that's a big. I want no, How come some of you have, have the names? Is, the only one that some, has the name is it because some are numbers. acting as peace officers and others are acting as law enforcement officers? Well, is that the reason? Okay, well, no, I don't talk to that. 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 No, I don't talk to that because it doesn't work. Put it down. <laughs> Put it down. <laughs> if it's not working, why not talk to it? Put it down. Rest your arm. Okay. Hang on, he's going to go on. That, that is a good one, too. It, it's simply up to my badge number is 1090. 1090. Um, officers, certain officers want the number. I always want to be identifiable either by the number. I always want people to see my name. There's only one in fair. It's a powerful name. So that's up to each it's officer's it's discretion whether that. That's what he said. <laughs> okay, one more quick and question. I am. I am. 
well, I, people I, person. I, I have been around for 24 years. I, 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 I have numbers. I don't think anybody else do, but they do. But I want to be more. I'm not by constable or sergeant or such and such. Can I ask one more quick question? Sergeant Fairwell. One more very quick question. Statutes. Do they have the force of law over those who deny consent to be governed? Statutes? The statutes. Does a statute like the Controlled Drugs and Substance Act, does it have the force of law over those who have denied consent to be governed? Sure, I'm losing. You lose me on that one because uh, I started work at 5 this morning and uh, that question's going to be I'll try one more time. Can I try one more time? No. No? No, I don't want to play. No. Okay. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Why? Because I've got a Sony millimeter too, and that one doesn't work. Really? Your, yours doesn't work, or this one? Trust you should look at the menu. Know. You'll find you got you got an option to turn that red light off or on, eh? You got to go to menu though. <laughs> Stand on that side of the line. We let you guys cross to our side. Fair is fair. See you later. One more, then I go. Got any papers? It's always nice to have a sense of humor. Oh, that's very important. I it is very important. Yeah. Peace to you guys. Thanks. Have a good night. That's right. They didn't have any papers. Papers? Papers? Rob Christie. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is only my second or third time doing this, so bear with me. Uh, Anyway, uh, I met uh, my brother Freeman Menard through my friend Clint here. I actually met them both the same day, so uh, it was quite a, quite a change in my life. Um, I was already kind of down this path uh, through health and spirituality and stuff, trying to kind of find out what, what was bugging me my whole life. You know, was, you're angry or this and you're that, and it's like, well, there's something there that's really bugging me. I don't know what it is. So I tried the spiritual stuff, and there's lots of answers in there. I got lots of the pieces of the puzzle and the health stuff, and that's, that was good too, but there was still something that was missing. So I met uh, uh, Clint and, and Rob and uh, <clears throat> started to hear what Rob had to say. I'd gone into the natural person stuff, and I'd, I'd you know, listened to some other stuff. And, and I wanted to, uh, to thank everybody who has come before us and, and done a lot, paved a lot of this road for us because... Uh, They've been trudging through the muck for a long time, so, so a lot of honor to those people. Um, so anyway, I uh, I met Rob, and uh, he started to tell me some of the stuff that you know he was that he'd found out, and um, so I figured, well, I need to kind of prove this somehow, and I, I need to make it work for me. I got to see how this works, so. Looking at the whole thing, I was like, well, parking tickets. Parking tickets are uh, not criminal, and um, you can kind of you know, see what's going to happen with parking tickets, and there's really no consequence other than money at the end of the day. So, so I uh, <clears throat> started to get parking tickets, and uh, I got a few parking tickets, and uh, we responded. We initially responded by uh, conditionally accepting, saying, you know, we, we accept this, uh, but in order for me to administrate this, uh, I need a I need a bill, and because uh, according to their rules, they have the Bills of Exchange Act, and they have rules, and they're supposed to follow them. So uh, I'm thinking to myself, well, if I'm going to play the game, and I'm going to be in here, and they want me to follow the rules, well, I'm going to have to, well, I'm going to hold them to it anyway. I I can't be the only guy playing by the rules. So anyway, we look on these parking tickets. The first one, they uh, they. They gave me a, I can't remember what they called it, but they let the first one go. They were like, we'll let that one go, kind of a thing. But I kept getting parking tickets, and they towed my car. And, and, uh, then, and then one day, uh, I got pulled over. It was 11 o'clock at night, and, they, and the guy pulled me over. And, uh, and I was with my wife and, and small child. And, and, they, and the guy pulls me over, and he says, uh, 
or actually, he didn't even pull me over. I was pu pulled over the side of the road, dropping somebody off at the bus stop, and this cop drives by me. And then he stops and flicks on his cherries and backs up. And, and I'm sitting at the bus stop, and I'm like, what did I do? I'm not even moving here. So he comes up to the window and says whatever, and I'm like, what did I do? And he's like, uh, I need to see some ID. Well, what did I do? And then he steps back, and he gets all puffy, and he's like this, and he says, uh, I need to see some ID. And so this is all kind of new to me, and I'm not really going to push it. My wife and child are in the car. And so I'm like, all right, all right, all right. So I pull out my driver's license, and I give it to him. And he's like, I'm going to have to ask you to step out of the car. And we go through the whole rigmarole. And so I'm like, what's going on? Well, you got some outstanding parking tickets. And I'm like, well, these aren't even criminal offenses. Why am I getting arrested? And you know where I live. So what's all this about? Well, whatever. we got to get you to sign this promise to appear and whatever. And I'm like, well, what if I don't sign it? What happens? And he says, uh, well, then you go to jail. So my wife at the time is from the States, and she hadn't got her driver's license and all that stuff. So I'm like, well, I can't leave my child stranded at the side, and my wife stranded at the side of the road, so I'll sign the, sign the paper. So I sign it, and I sign it under duress, and, and uh, that's fine. They let me go, and I go home. So anyway, that, that's that. and then uh, So I have to go to court. I've got this court date. So we go into court, and I, and I took... And Rob came with me, and he was acting as my agent. So we walk in the courtroom, and the uh, prosecutor stands up when she hears Rob say his name. We don't want Mr. Menard in here. So I'm, I'm like, well, that's interesting. So <clears throat> this goes on for like a year and a half. Nine months of the time, she's trying to get Rob to not be my agent. Uh, so then we ask a constitutional question. One of the thing was, uh, one of the questions in it was basically, you know, can a can a cop use a child as ransom to to get assigned security interest? And, uh, you know, we thought it was a pretty straightforward question. I mean, what's the answer to that? Obviously, they can't do that. But anyway, so we got no reply, or we got a reply, actually, and that's in the book. We got a reply from one of the attorney generals or somebody, and, uh, and uh, so saying that we're not going to come and do anything with this. So, so as it turns out, we end up going to provin provincial court because we were in traffic court in front of a JP. You go to provincial court for a constitutional question. So... We get in front of the judge, and right away the prosecutor stands up. We're not letting Mr. Menard be the, we don't want him to be the agent. We don't want to talk to him. We don't want him in the courtroom. And uh, he, and then she said, uh, the, the JP from the other court said that he wasn't allowed to be a lawyer. He was doing all this stuff, and it, she's lying. She lied right to the court. And I turned to Rob, and I said, am I allowed to do that? And he's like, no, no, you can't do that. I'm like, well, this is ridiculous. So, so anyway, that, uh, that was the provincial court, and they end up adjourning that, and we have to come back a little while later. So uh, that was another interesting story in of itself, and that'll be in a, in a book that we're working on. But, um, so, so eventually we go back, and I, and I now have done all my free man stuff. I've sent in my notice of understanding because I've, I've learned a few things, obviously, in this thing. One, they don't follow their own rules. They want me to follow these rules, and they use all these words and stuff against me. And, um, and uh, so I'm like, well, I don't want to play this game. I don't, so, and then I've learned, I've also learned, obviously, that these words, I can't understand these words. These are words written in another language. You have to be a lawyer to understand them. I can't understand them. How can I, in any conscience whatsoever, be bound by something I can't understand? And secondly, there are thousands of pages of documents and stuff, and it's like, well, how easy is this? This was made for us, and it's supposed to help us, and it's ours, and we made it so we can't even understand it. So anyway, Rob's going to talk about the whole lawyers and all that stuff in, later on, but, but I can't understand it. There's no way that I can understand it unless I'm a member of the bar, so I'm not going to be bound by it. And um, so we go into court, and, uh, and I go in as a free man. I've done all my stuff. Uh, Rob walks in. The, law, the judge right away says, we can't hear you. Um, so then we go outside with the prosecutor, and she says, well, or she, she says, are you going to come in? I said, well, what's your name? I need your bar card. I need this information. And are you, uh, are you uh, claiming that I'm the accused or the charged party or whatever we said? And she wouldn't say anything. She just laughs. and She walks back into the courtroom. And so we get into the courtroom, and they start their trial, an ex parte trial while I'm sitting in there. And they're not pointing to me as the accused party. So I'm thinking, great. They're not, I'm, in, I'm in the courtroom. They're looking for a guy named Christy Robert Scott, and they're, they're going through the thing. And... They're not looking at me, so I'm not the guy they want. So this is part of my, this is how I won. I, they don't want to talk to me. They don't want to talk. When they said they don't want to talk to Rob, I'm like, great, isn't that awesome? They don't want to talk to you. 
They don't want to talk to me. I told my dad the whole story, and after months of years of arguing and, and the whole thing, he's like, well, isn't that what you wanted? And I was like, oh, you got that. Yeah, that's what I wanted. I don't want them to talk to me. I don't want to have any a part of them because I can't understand it, and my conscience doesn't dictate that I should be a part of fraud and all that stuff. So so that's where I am anyway, uh, and uh, it's, been a, it's been quite a journey. Uh, I've learned a lot in the last little while, and... Uh, and it's been uh, it's been a, it's been an honor to work with Rob and uh, and a pain, you know. He's but that's okay. We we all accept each other for what we are. So uh, anyway, Rob Menard is the next guy you're going to hear, and it's an honor to introduce him to you. And so are you coming back out here? It's all good. Everybody, if we could have a massive hand for Robert Arthur Menard Freeman on the land, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Clint. Folks, let's keep it going for Clint and uh, Robert Christie over there. And also, while we're here, we, we've got a whole lot of giants in the movement here. We've got Mary Elizabeth Croft right here. Let's have a round of applause for her, folks. If you haven't read her book, you can check it out on the Internet. I, uh, I'm not going to tell you the title. Just Google uh, Mary Elizabeth Croft because I don't remember the title to it. How I clobbered every cash confiscatory. She can't find a publisher because of the title. <laughs> Folks, we also have some other people here. We've got uh, uh, Reverend Belanger back there. Let's have a round of applause for him. <laughs> Mr. Gordon Schiller is in the audience. He's a no, he can stay seating. <laughs> Folks, these people have done a whole lot of work on this movement, and I, I might, uh, the way I look at it, I, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. So if I can see a little bit further than, than they can, it's only because of the work that they have done. Um, who here is, is anyone here from Valley View? Are you? Okay, I'm going to talk about that place then. Oh my God, little quick story for you before I start on the law. I used to do stand-up comedy. I go into Valley View, Valley View, Alberta, Bama is how I call it. <laughs> I go in there at 6 o'clock in the morning. I go in for breakfast. I sit down. I'm the only person in this restaurant. I order bacon and eggs. I'm not even going to talk about the bacon or the eggs. Hash browns. I figure if you're a cook in Canada, you better know how to make hash browns. My hash browns come, they're about three chunks of potato the size of softballs. They look like they were boiled for three minutes, rolled off, fell onto the, the grill, rolled onto my plate. I cut them open, they're raw in the center. The waitress comes over, she says, is everything okay? I said, no, these potatoes, they're raw in the center, look at that. She said, oh, that's how the cook cooks them. <laughs> I said, darling, when the end product is raw, you have no right using the word cook either as a noun or a verb. They're not cooked. She said, well, that's how the cook cooks them. I said, well, I can't eat them. She said, well, that's how the cook cooks them. I said, okay, watch this. This is how the customer doesn't pay for them. Take them away and take them off my bill. She looked at me like I had just asked her to squash a litter of puppies with a fridge. <laughs> she said, I can't do that. I said, why not? She said, I punch a button, the bill comes up. I have to charge you what's on that bill. I said, okay, I think I can help you out here. How much is a side of potatoes? A dollar fifty. How much is my large milk here? A dollar fifty. I said, fine, take away the potatoes and don't charge me for the milk. <laughs> she looked at me like I was from another planet. You know what she said? Milk, how can you do that? I said, because of the potatoes. She looked at me and she won the argument. She said, milk ain't potatoes. <laughs> Right then I realized when she asked me, is everything okay to her, that was just a rhetorical question. So I asked her, I said, why do you even bother asking me, is everything okay, if there's absolutely nothing you can do about it when it's not? I thought I broke her. She, she wandered off, talked to the manager, came back, said, would you like a complaint form? I look in the kitchen, there's two cooks, three wait staff, the manager, I'm the only rest I'm the only customer in there. They can't cook potatoes, but they have complaint forms already for me. I said, You better bring me two of them. She brought me two, I put my potatoes in it, wrapped it up, said, Here, you put that on the manager's desk. So I go upstairs at 6 o'clock in the morning. I go upstairs to try to sleep on what is essentially a pile of springs with a little bit of cloth on top of it. 
11 o'clock is rolling around. What's coming on? Law and Order, one of my favorite shows. I'm thinking Law and Order, fries and gravy. I haven't had my daily ration of potatoes yet, right? Law and Order, fries and gravy. I go downstairs to the same restaurant. I look at the menu, and I, something really striking. I, I found this very funny. They had put the preposition the in front of everything on that menu. The order of fries, the side of gravy, the hamburger, like they only had one of each. <laughs> I looked at that, I said, oh, look at this. I'd like the order of fries and the side of gravy. Fries and gravy? The order of fries and the side of gravy. Fries and gravy? The order of fries, the side of gravy. Fries and gravy? Yes, fries and gravy. She goes into the kitchen, fries and gravy, comes back out with my to-go container. I open it up, fries smothered in gravy. Now, this is not what I wanted. When I'm watching Law & Order, I need to be able to control the fry-to-gravy factor per individual fry. <laughs> sometimes I want some gravy, sometimes I don't. What I don't want is a great big soggy mess. I said, look, I didn't want this. I specifically ordered from the menu. I said the order of fries and the side of gravy. She said, you said yes to fries and gravy. I said, well, that's what I ordered, the order of fries, the side of gravy. Well, around here, when someone says yes to fries and gravy, that means they want the gravy on the fries. I said, I'm glad I didn't order soup and salad. <laughs> but this isn't what I want. I said, let's try it again. You take this away, because what I want, I pulled out the menu, I want the order of fries and the side of gravy. F fries with gravy on the side? The order of fries with the side of gravy. Fries with gravy on the side? Yes, fine. He, she goes in, now he wants the gravy on the side. The cook looks out at me like I'm the devil. Finally, my thing comes, I got like two minutes to law and order, right? I open it up, gravy, fries poured down one side. I went, listen, I didn't want a full soggy mess. What makes you think I want half a soggy mess? I said, look, I want a side of gravy. I want my gravy in a separate container. I'll pay for this one, throw it away, give it to someone. But here's what I want. I want virgin fries. I want fries that don't know ketchup, never met mayo, couldn't spell gravy if their life depended on it. All I want are fries. Okay, fine. She goes in. Now all he wants are fries. They have to almost hold this cook back, eh? <laughs> Finally, the fries come. I open it. Fine. That's what I want. Now, you go. now go get me some gravy. <laughs> She don't touch my fries. Just go get me gravy. She's like, well, how can I get you gravy if you won't let me give me your fry container? I'm, don't you have a little container that you can put some gravy in? You know what she said to me? Those are for mayo. <laughs> I highlight the story one. I wanted to start off with a bit of humor. But plus, it expresses how much language is important to us. It expresses that someone, you might use the exact same language as someone else, but if you don't understand, if you're operating upon a presumption or an assumption, you are not going to get what you want. These words mean things, and if you don't know what these words mean, you are going to be getting soggy fries when you want virgin fries and a side of gravy. And the law society loves doing this. They want you to eat the soggiest fries imaginable. Now, let's ask ourselves, why are we all here? Look, a, group, a room full of people from uh, young, old, uh, all sorts. I mean, from across the, the entire community spectrum. Why are we all here? I think we're all here because we know on a fundamental level in our hearts that we have a right to peace and abundance, and we aren't getting this. It's like there's a big stink in the room. Everyone can smell it. Everyone's going, oh, my God, who cut that one? And there's a group of lawyers in the corner with nose plugs on saying, smells like roses to me. We know there's a big stink in the room. We know that they use words they will claim are our laws that have the force of law over us. And yet at the same time, they will claim that we cannot possibly understand these words because we are not a lawyer. There's a guy by the name of uh, David E. Sherman. He's a, one of the premier tax accountants. And if you look in uh, Snafu and Google uh, David E. Sherman, he's on the record as stating these detaxers think they know the, what they're talking about. They read something that looks like English, but it's not. It's law, and they can't understand it. I called them on that. I said, if they can't understand it, how is it constitutional to use this to create liability on them? Never heard back from them. 
I think that's why we're here, and more importantly, what we want is we want to find remedy to this situation. We don't want to just sit around complaining about it. Glad you could make it. Yeah, Valley View, I was in Valley View. I got some potatoes. They were uncooked. Got some fries. I'm just catching you up, talking about why we're here. We want remedy. We want our power back. We want our remedy, and we want to hold these people to the... We don't want to beat them up. We want abundance. We want peace. We don't want a life of conflict with these people. And we shouldn't have to dig through the shit they manufacture in order to find the diamonds of our freedom. To recap bursting bubbles of government deception, I look at what I'm about to teach you as high school. Bursting bubbles was essentially grade school. Fundamental three things you should have learned. One, you are not a person. You have a person. It exists in association with you. Statutes are not laws. They do not apply to you. They apply to your person. And finally, believe it or not, you want your freedom. You want to become a free man on the land. You have to treat these people with compassion, regardless of what they've done to you. And I know how difficult that can be. When you can take all of these things and put it together and use it in this information that I present to you tonight, you are going to have more power than you can imagine over these people. Maybe not power to command them, but they certainly won't be trying to claim any power over you. A lot of us, we look at them as bullies. I've dealt with a lot of bullies in my life. The bully wants to find the weakest person. If they know that you are going to fight them and you're going to just keep fighting them, eventually they know that what's going to happen, you're going to figure out their little bully tricks and there's going to come a day where you're going to start winning. Or eventually the whole schoolyard is going to watch you fight them and say, hey, he's not that tough, let's get him. And the whole schoolyard jumps on him. They're not happy with this. Now, I, I've achieved the status of a free man on the land. I've been researching the law probably about six years now. Last count, I got about 17,000 hours in studying the law, deconstructing it, acting as an agent for people, and helping people find remedy within the system. A free man on the land, in case you don't know what it is, a free man on the land is a human being in a common law jurisdiction who has revoked consent to be represented and thus governed and therefore is not subject to any statutory obligations, restraints, bylaws, orders, anything like that. What you call a law has nothing to do with me. And this has been uh, proven to me a number of times. The last time I got stopped by a cop, 11.30 at night, I'm at a bus station. I'm at a bus stop. I got 12 beer beside me. I'm going over to my friend's place. I crack a beer, a cop goes by, I went, oh, this is going to be fun. He pulls right up, he gets right out, and you know how they get out, they're all angry. Hey, what are you doing? You're drinking in public, that's against the law. You know I could arrest you under the Liquor Licensing Act, the Liquor Control Act, and I could confiscate your beer. The first thing I do, God's peace to you, good officer. If you're going to arrest me, I want you to know I'm a peaceful man and there will be no violence necessary. I, but I'm pretty sure you don't have the legal right to do any of that. So I immediately bring him down. He gets to a point where he, 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 there's no more anger there. You can talk to them if there's no more anger there. So he starts asking me, well, what's your name? And actually he said, I could confiscate your beer. I said, you're going to remove my beer without clear lawful authority? Because that's the definition of confiscate. So at that point, you start using some of these words, and you know the definition of them. He's, he's going to st step back a little bit. He's looking for the weak. He's looking for the people who have no idea what these words mean. <clears throat> he asked me for my name. I said, well, I, I'd love to help you, but I don't know if you're operating legally or lawfully. I don't know if you want my legal name or a lawful name. He goes, well, I'm acting legally. I want your legal name. I said, do you have proof of claim I have an obligation to have such a thing? Okay, fine. I'm acting lawfully. <laughs> fine. My name's Rob. What's your last name? Why do you need that if you're acting lawfully? I don't even have a last name. I have a family name. Okay, well, what's your family name? So finally, he seemed like a decent guy. We were talking a little bit. He used to do masonry. I, I told him I was a mason. So I, I gave him the information. He punches it in his computer. He's there. I'm sitting over here. He punches my name in the computer, looks at it, squints. I smile and wave. <laughs> He looks at it, gets on the horn. He's on that horn for a good five minutes. Comes out, puts down the horn. He's like, Whew. comes out. You know what he says to me? Mr. Menard, the West Vancouver Police Department would be deeply appreciative if you would refrain from drinking alcohol in public. <laughs> Couldn't get away fast enough. They punch my name in that computer. It comes up, free man on the land, no statutory charges without the express written consent of the Attorney General. They don't want anything to do with me. 
This is the power that you can have over these people. This is what, it doesn't mean there is no law. It doesn't mean that I can go out and I can harm. It doesn't mean I can damage property. It doesn't mean I can use fraud in my contract. It just means that they can't use their words to dictate my actions. They're not my words. Now, why is it that they get to apply these words against you, but they don't apply them against me? What have I done that has allowed this situation to develop? It's very simple. You're all sinners. <laughs> yeah, not that I'm a saint, because I'm not. But you are all sinners. You have a social insurance number. Do you know what that means? You sin. You're collateral to them. Close. It was a rhetorical question. <laughs> they have ruled. They identify it. When you go in there, they, they call that social insurance number an employee identification number. The, you, if you want to pay into the Canada Pension Plan, you need a social insurance number. The courts have ruled payment into a pension plan is prima facie evidence of employee status. Only employees pay into a pension plan. They'll tell you you need this number to work legally in Canada. Change the in to for and you're closer to the truth. You're working for Canada. If someone tells you, I work legally in Walmart, are they not also then automatically working legally for Walmart? The fact is, your social insurance number means you are all government agents. When I hear you complaining about the government, I don't hear citizens complaining about their lawful government. I hear employees bitching about their employer. You're, You're the sinner. That is your original sin. You were born into abundance, into freedom. And you went and you gave it all up. And now, the way to look at it, the reason this is important, imagine a box of chocolates for a minute. Okay, imagine it's, I want you all to imagine it, and I'll stand here until it manifests. <laughs> Come on, you're laughing, not imagining. Imagine a box of chocolates. You take a chocolate out of the box. What happens to it? Within 24 hours, it's shit. <laughs> chocolates stay in the box. The, the Constitution Act is the box of chocolates. The Constitution restricts and constrains all statutes, regulations, orders, and bylaws. Those are the chocolates. They stay in the box. Let's close that box up and look at who it is addressed to. Then we know who we can force feed these chocolates to. Look in Section 32 of the Constitution Act, and it will tell you that this Constitution Act and therefore everything constrained within it, this box of chocolates and the chocolates, are applicable only to federal, provincial, and municipal agents, employees, and, and those. And that's why all of these acts, all of these statutes, have the force of law over you, because you are a government agent. These rules were never, ever meant so that governments could control us. These are the rules that are in place so that we can control our government. You go into Walmart, a Walmart employee, he's going to have certain rules that he does, he's not allowed to do things. He can't come in and have alcohol on his breath. Who says you can't go into Walmart after having a couple of beer? You don't work there. All of these rules that they use, the Income Tax Act, that's why you have to pay income tax. If you go to a, a temporary job placement agency, they will set you up with a job, but now you have to pay them a portion of what you earn. Why? Because you were working as an agent for them. That's why you have to pay income tax to the federal government. You are working as a federal agent under a contract for service instead of a free man under a contract for hire. I think of it like a tiger in a cage. You go to a zoo, you find a tiger, there's a big cage around it. You all jumped into the tiger's enclosure and now you're complaining about the fangs and the sharp claws of the tiger. But what separates, if you go to a zoo, what separates the tiger from the people who are, who are th just there to enjoy the zoo? Yeah, a cage made of bars. What are lawyers a member of? The bar. The purpose of these lawyers are to act to separate us from the tiger with all their claws. Now, if we can step outside of the cage, if we can step outside of the box, instead of having to worry about, oh, here's a chair, here's a whip, here's how you fight the tiger, get him in the corner. and, and do, No, you just step out of the box. 
you don't go poking the tiger with a stick from the other side of the cage. I mean, that's not going to be nice. But you can just say, no, I'm done with you. I'm done with all of your words. I'm going for a hot dog and some candy floss, and you're staying in your cage. These are their words. I, I have less information about uh, Alberta statutes, but I'm willing to bet it's very similar to what I find in British Columbia. Under the Legal Profession Act, it states that only members of the Legal Profession Act may create documents for use in court, may create or file documents for use in court. What are statutes? What are regulations? What are orders? Do words that they alone create. Even if we say our representatives are doing it, it goes through the lawyers and they say either yes or no to it. Remember, a statute is defined as a legislated rule of a society which has been given the force of law. Who can give these words the force of law over you? Only you. Everything that you complain about, about the government, is all a result of your voluntary actions. No one forced you to take a sin. You went and you begged for it. You applied, you submitted an application for your sin. Now, the good thing about it, I looked into that act. When I figured this out, I looked into that act like a 13-year-old looks into a brothel. I was like, I'm going to figure this out. You know what one thing they can't do? You know what they can't do? They can't stop you from abandoning that number. No one can force you to be their employee for the rest of your life. You can abandon that number at any time, and the moment you do, you are no longer within that box. Now, they'll try to continue uh, placing these orders upon you. They'll try to continue act, uh, uh, controlling your life, but there are ways to deal with that as well. I got a question for you. Who here has a driver's license? Unfortunately. Okay, now who here? Keep your hands in the air. Okay, put your hands down if you put your hand up higher. I see you cheating. <laughs> higher. Put your hands down if you actually read the Motor Vehicle Act before applying for your license. Huh. How do you know you have any obligation under that act to have a license if you've never even read it? You pay income tax. Who here has ever read the Income Tax Act before paying their income tax? It's 2,566 pages long. Did you read it? No. There's a maxim in law, a Roman maxim that says, let he who would be deceived be deceived. If you aren't even willing, if someone comes up to you and says, you have to do this, why? Oh, how do you know that? Everybody knows it. <laughs> oh, really? Nobody read the act, but everybody knows it. You start reading these act and you start finding the remedy within it. If, we, if you are willing to accept, if you are willing to go and get a license, you are submitting an application for a license, what are you doing? You, Given up a right. You're asking permission. You are asking permission to engage in a completely lawful activity. Therefore, what are you? You're a child who asks permission to engage in lawful activities. Children ask that. Mommy, can I have a cookie? If you're old enough, let's suppose for a moment, your parents own a bakery. And every day you go to that bakery and you ask the person, can I have a cookie, can I have a cookie? Sure, you can have a cookie. Don't tell your dad, here you go. Or no, your dad said you can't. But you go and you ask for a cookie and you don't have the right to come and take one. But there comes a day where you grow up, your dad passes away, you inherit that, that shop. Are you asking for a cookie anymore? No. My cookies give or find the door. You have the power then. Our buddy, this, this child of the province thing came up, because I'm, I'm rather active in writing my letters and whatnot. Our buddy Digger, he's coming out of Park Royal, and he's, he's got his keys. I, I think he was going to his car, I don't know. But let's say he is, just for the sake of the story. He's going to a car. The cops stop, and they pull up, and they say, well, who are you? Do you have your driver's license? We want to see your ID. And Digger knows his rights, eh? And he's like, why are you asking me for ID when I don't have an obligation to have such a thing? But you do. I want to see your ID. I want to see your business card. I want to see your badge. And they start, well, do you have a driver's license? Are you claiming I need such a thing? And they asked him something very telling. So you're not a child of the province then? No. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Drove right off. There is the legal status of being a child of your province because you haven't grown up enough. You go and you ask permission to engage in these lawful activities when you have remedy in the form of a claim of right that you can make. Anything you can do under license within the legislative framework, you must be able to do without license outside of that framework 
or else the licensing authority is licensing unlawful activities. Can you get a license to do B&Es? Can you get a license to do assaults? No. License to kill? Well, that's James. <laughs> Leave the funny to me, buddy. <laughs> the question is, the question we're at, who is going to be master? That's the only question. Humpty Dumpty knew it. Who is going to be master in this game? Are you going to be master of the government or is government going to be master over you? Now, how do we claim mastery over people? Or not so much over them, but how do we ensure that they aren't trying to be masters over us? As they have treated us like children, because we were acting like children, so must we treat them like children. You, who here are most our parents, I imagine? Everyone have kids? Are you not masters over your kids? Why? Well, when you were younger, when they were younger, maybe. When they were younger, what makes you master over them is your ability to grab them and raise them up. They come and they try kicking you in the shin. You laugh at them. Ha, 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 that doesn't hurt. And you raise them up. Who's in charge now? You are clearly the one who has the power if you can raise up the people in government. And the trick to this, why can you do this from your kids? Why is it possible for you to accept your kids doing things that you might not like and yet you don't get all angry with them as you would with the government? Why? Because you love them. When they were born, you allowed your heart to expand and that expansion of the heart gave you the power to raise them up. You're going to be treating the government in the exact same fashion. You're going to allow your heart to expand and you are going to have power over them because you know that they are the children. You have the moral high ground. You're acting mature. You are willing to deal with them on whatever level they want, but you have the power. And once they start recognizing that, if they come at you and, oh, put them up, put them up. Oh, really? <laughs> You're so cute. Come here. Pick them up. <laughs> now get in your room. When you bring out that attitude, it's far different. They, I had to go to jail a couple of times. I mean, I, I, in this action, it's not easy. You know, I've been placed under arrest. But when they came and arrest me, they, oh, Mr. Menard, we have to place you under arrest. Okay, fine. Sat there for, with my coffee. Finally, the paddy wagon pulled up. Okay, well, we've got to put cuffs on you now. Okay, fine. Put it on. And it's under protest and arrest every step of the way. He noted the protest. I get into the holding cell, and I get in there, and there's like 15 people in there. I'm like... So who's here under statutory charges? I'm going to teach you about the law. Two, 15 <laughs> seconds later, the door opens. They grab me, take me out. They couldn't get me out of that holding cell fast enough, eh? And they're asking me to sign a return, an ROR, a return on recognizance. And I'm not signing that. Well, you have to sign it. You'll go back in that holding cell. Fine, bunch of people in there to teach. <laughs> Okay, you just sit there. They, he, he, the sergeant, he tried intimidating me. He, come here, come here. Because I was sitting over there. You just sit there and you make up your mind. So he calls me over. Don't you try to intimidate me. You're going to sign this document. I'm saying, okay, fine. Listen, you want me to sign it? Yes, I do. I'll sign it. But it's under protest and duress. <sighs> fine, just sign it. So I signed it under duress. As I give it to him, you know that signature isn't really there. <laughs> Take it, got out. They didn't want me in there. If you go through this enough times, they get to the point where they know that you know what is right, what is wrong, and you're willing to sacrifice for it. If when you go through these procedures, you are acting with respect to the cops, if you aren't questioning so much, I try not to question their intelligence, their integrity, or their intent. Merely the meaning of the words that they're using to claim authority and their knowledge of what those words mean. If they don't have that information, they should just back right off. And the cops, at least out in Vancouver and B.C., they're coming around. They are coming around in a huge way. People are getting tickets saying, that's a bill of exchange and I want the original. Uh, another one. Let's <laughs> close that one. Here's a warning. And they're not doing it anymore. How do we get to this point, though? How do we get them to recognize that they're the nanny and we have grown up and they have no more power as nanny over us? It's about how we treat them, about how we act. If we're shitting our pants, pardon the language, ladies and sensitive guys, but if we're pooping our drawers, Nanny has a right and a duty to put diapers on us, and she will do that. If you're throwing a tantrum, Nanny has the power and the right to come grab you, throw you in your room until you settle down. If you're rebellious, Nanny's got a right to put limits upon you as long as you're in the house. Nanny is tired. 
She wants us to stop rebelling. If you get to the point where you say, Nanny, I'm not rebelling anymore. I'm just old enough now and I'm in charge of the house and uh, you're not telling me what time I'm going to bed. I'm telling you I'm going out all night. I'll be back at 7. You'll have breakfast ready. You take power over them when you act within that, that capacity. If you treat them like children, if you aren't shitting your pants, you're not throwing tantrums, and what I sense on a lot of, a lot of the people in, in the, the freedom movement, they're very rebellious towards everything that they're doing. We want to get away from that. We don't want to be in permanent conflict with these people. They want us in conflict. That generates the revenue. We want to find the place of peace and the place of abundance. So how do we do this? When they're coming at us and they're making ludicrous demands upon us that we know we could make upon them, how do we find that balance? Since it is about peace and we are going to be the adults here, what I think of, think of, Mud pies. Your kid comes to you and they've got a mud pie and they say, here, look, mommy, daddy, I baked you a pie. And you say, that's not a pie. That's a bunch of mud with some rabbit droppings spelling out I love you and a bunch of leaves on it. I'm not eating that. Your ch kid's going to cry. You dishonored them. You've locked them out. I mean, people say, oh, that's not a real bill. We don't have real money. There's no real commercial uh, uh, transactions available to them. If you order your kid to bake you a pie and then you lock them out of the kitchen, you don't even give them access to the pantry, this mud pie is all they've got. Now, how do you deal with a mud pie when a kid comes and brings it to you? To make them not cry, to accept it, you say, oh, that's a beautiful mud pie. Thank you very much. I'm going to eat that right up. Hey, I've got to share it with you. Go get some cutlery. Even a four-year-old knows, I don't want to eat that. <laughs> well, you want me to eat it? Here, look, I'll taste some. You put a little on your... Hey, isn't that Barney? They turn around, you throw the mud away. Oh, that was a beautiful mud pie. Go get me some more. I want another mud pie, and this time you're going to eat it. When you, if you can accept everything they bring you, merely as mud pie, merely as a kid trying to serve you, trying to be nice to you, they're trying to give you a service, regardless of whether or not you accept it as edible, then you start having power over them because you can accept without generating conflict. You can conditionally accept. You say, I accept whatever it is you're giving me upon this condition. You place your own conditions and you make those conditions too difficult for them to, to fulfill. <clears throat> this is what the whole acceptance for value routine is about. You've all heard of acceptance for value? Trying to explain accepted for value, acceptance for value. Change the acceptance to accepted, change the for to as, and you accept it as valuable. Someone comes and brings you a mud pie, and you say, I accept that this is valuable. You give them evidence of this, now they can go to a third party. If someone gave me a document, a remittance, and I take it and I say, I accept that this is valuable, now give it back to them. Now you have two parties who have both claimed that a certain document has value. It's a valuable document and it must be because two people have just accepted it as such. You can now take this document to the third party, not me, my fiduciary agent or the government, whoever you want to direct it to, but that third party must accept that this document, this mud pie, is real pie because you've accepted it as such. They use tricky language, like acceptance for value took me a long time to try to understand what they were doing there until I said accept it as valuable. Okay, I can see that. It's evidence that someone provided you with a service. They might have been a government agent just bringing you mud pie. It might be service in the form of a ticket. It might be service in the form of a summons or anything like that. But all they're doing is trying to serve you. The problem with acceptance for value is knowing what you can and cannot accept and how to deal with something. If you get a notice, you shouldn't be accepting that for value because all it is is a notice. You deal with a notice with your own notice. And you take their notice. What I used to do is I'd take their notice, I'd write on the back, here's my notice, uh, and it's a di notice of discharge of alternative notice or, or notice of discharge of notice by way of seeking clarification. They're trying to communicate with me. I don't know what your words mean. What does this word mean? What does this word mean? What does this word mean? Balls in your court. And they, they never want to start playing that. If you get a remittance, and this is where when we went through with Rob with the whole uh, parking ticket issue, the end result was them sending a remittance. We looked that up. A remittance is a, a specie of money. 
sent by one merchant to another, but it has to be signed. Look at the money in your pocket. It has a signature. It has two parties accepting it as valuable. Those you can sign. Those you can assign value to. You say, I accept this as valuable. You give it back to them. They now have something that they can take and pay. What we found with the parking tickets, they would send you this remittance, and what they want you to do is not touch that, but send that back, that original document, with a check for the value of the remittance. So they are getting two species of money. They've got 80 bucks in that envelope, not 40, and they're using this check to act as in an administrative capacity for you, and they are adding value to that. It's called twinning a stream of revenue, and it's highly unlawful, and we caught them at it in Vancouver. So, it, and when we first did it, the first time we did it, they accepted it. They, they didn't want us doing it over and over. Yeah, they claimed it was a typo. We asked the girl, we said, this, says a, this is a remittance. Look, Black's Law Dictionary, specie of money. She went, she said, we're going to talk to uh, the lawyer. She went, talked to the lawyer, came back. Oh, uh, the lawyer told me it's a typo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll buy that one for a dollar. Like... Like, lawyers make typos. A typo is when there's one T in remittance, not when you change receipt for remittance. There's a big difference. <laughs> and the fact that they want it back is very telling. The other thing I found, now, to, to realize what your remedy is. Uh, one of the big problems is we're in rebellion. The government gives us an order, a government agent, a lawyer, or a judge, a JP. They'll try to give us orders. We say, I don't want to accept that order. Nah, 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 nah. And then you're in conflict, and that's what we're trying to avoid is the conflict. I was at a bar. Surprise, surprise. I'm sitting there. The waitress comes up and asks this guy, and you know how sometimes you just have to see the cart before, you ho before the horse before you realize what's going on? She came up and she asked this, uh, this guy, are you ready for your bill? Yes, please bring me my bill. She turned to this couple, would you like to place your order? I went, ding, click. Bills follow orders. When have you ever in your life made or placed an order and then not been immediately liable for a bill? Go to McDonald's, you'll see what I mean. You order food, bang, here's your bill, pay up, you pay the bill, your order is filled. You go into court, they try giving you orders, they do it all the time. Cops will give you orders. If they go in there, and you see this, if you go into court, you watch them, they'll give you an order, and then they just want to get you out of there as fast as possible because you have a right at that point to accept their order and give them a bill. I'm ordering you to pay a fine of $1,000. I accept your order. Here's my bill for 2000 Pull out your checkbook, judge. They are liable for bills the moment they give you an order. Bills as in bill? No. no, a bill as in uh, an order to pay. Now, one of the problems that I've noticed with a lot of people in this whole movement and in the, the whole system is that we think that we have to win right now. We're in court. Oh, well, I failed. I messed up. What if I were to tell you that you have three days grace at any time, it doesn't matter what you're dealing with, if it's a parking ticket, a, a violation ticket, a court order, you always have three days grace. The reason is, what they are doing is called a transaction of a security interest. You guys have here a Law and Equity Act, look up that Law and Equity Act anytime you go to court, if you have to, bring that Law and Equity Act in. I call it the Monopoly Bat. Imagine you're playing Monopoly. And at one point, you pull out the bat, and you get to bang the table with the bat, and all the pieces go flying, and the banker has to put all the pieces back exactly where they were. You get to order pizza, and the banker has to pay for that pizza. That's the power that you have in that Law and Equity Act. In British Columbia, it tells us it's uh, applicable. The, the laws enacted and declared within this act are applicable in any court or tribunal in British Columbia and they must use it. If you bring it in, they have to accept it. The other two sections, section two and three, and likely you'll find the same thing, tells you what remedy you have under this act. And essentially it says, and they use a whole lot of smoke and mirrors to give you this information, any remedy that would have been available to you in 1876 is still available to you. Which means you can say, no, I'm not, I don't want a transaction with you. I don't want a contract with you. I don't want you to have any power or authority over me, and I'm not accepting it. You have all the power in the world to be a sovereign on this land. They don't want you to know that. 
if you recognize a, a security interest, a little background, a security interest is anything that's either tangible or intangible that can generate or create an obligation to either pay or perform a service. A violation ticket is a security interest. A court order is a security interest. If it's not a security interest, don't talk to me because it's all about obligations and liabilities. Do I have an obligation to pay or perform? If so, there was a transaction of a security interest every single time. Now, the beautiful thing about a transaction of a security interest is you always have three days and it says in it that a transaction of a security interest is not cured for three days and a transaction of a security interest is rendered void ab initio by anything that would invalidate a contract at law. Fraud, duress, mistake, uh, coercion, uh, I didn't want to contract, all of these things. So no matter what they do, you get a ticket, fine, I accept that. I recognize it's a transaction of a security interest and I'm operating under protest and duress and I want you to know that I'm going to be uh, voiding that within three days under the Law and Equity Act. So go ahead, give me whatever you want. Within 72 hours, it's going to be a nothing. You're taking it out of the box and I'm eating it. Could you define for the audience ab initio? Sorry, sorry. Ab initio means from the beginning, from, from, uh, from the initial. If everything they do, if you always have three days to discharge it, to, to render it void and invalid, why argue with them at the point that they're doing it? Why argue with them in court? Why argue with them when they're giving you a ticket? Oh, you can't give me a ticket. Oh, go ahead and give it to me. I'm, I've got my notices already. I'm just going to zero that out. They're doing their job. You're doing their, yours. They can't do anything about it, and once you start, uh, I'll show you how to get to this level later, once you start putting these red flags all over your name, they don't even try anymore. They know that, oh my God, either I'm going to be liable for that or you, it's a, just a waste of my time, isn't it? Absolutely, big waste of your time, officer. But if you want to do it, you go ahead. <laughs> when you bring this attitude, you start having more power over them because they, they expect you to, oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah, if you're not doing that, they're like, What's up with him? You're supposed to be scared and intimidated of me. Look, don't you see the gun? And you say, yeah, I see the gun. Guess what? See the smile? We have more power over them. All of their power that they have over you is a result of two things. Their deception, your ignorance. Sorry to be rude, but their deception doesn't work without your ignorance. And the way to deal with it is to deal with your ignorance. Then when their deception comes, you can look at them and smile. And you can tell them, you know, I'm not a child of the province. I don't know why you're trying to apply that to me. You can talk to them from a position of having power. And Clint will tell you, there, once you get to this position, you drive down, you see cops, you're not scared of them anymore. You don't get that, oh, the cops pulled me over. Yeah. And now it's a chance to test out my theories. This is going to be fun. Now, how do we do this, though? When, it, when I was doing my research, what I found was that way back when, the judges used to always ask if someone was making a, a claim for damages against them, if there was a claim, the judges were always asking, where's the notices? and they would demand to see the notices. And if there were no notices, okay, this is dismissed. You fail to notice the other party. I ended up doing more research. I found out they used to actually use all the time notices of understanding and intent. If they saw that there was a potential conflict brewing, they would actually act like adult human beings, respect each other, and serve notice of their understanding and their intent upon their fellow man. This is step number one. I think there's a lot of people out there who have been trying many esoteric kind of things, but if you are not operating upon a notice of understanding and intent and then a claim of right, you could lose every time. Maybe one time they'll let you in, maybe next time they don't let you in. You can't figure it out what's going on. When you do your notice of understanding and intent, it's their opportunity to discuss it with you. If they refuse to discuss it with you, they are accepting your understanding. They are sharing this understanding. Because you now have a shared understanding, you can share with them your intent. Once you've shared that intent with them, you give them 10 days. If they raise no dispute with this, you now hit them with a claim of right. They have 10 days to dispute that claim, and if not, it's cured. From that point forward, every time you're doing whatever it is you mentioned in your notice of intent, you are operating upon a right and upon a claim of right, which is very important. Read section 39 of the criminal code. 
the claim of right allows you to use, you can either you or your, your authorized agents or representative can use whatever level of force or violence is necessary to protect whatever property you have if you are holding it under a claim of right, even against those who are legally entitled to seize and possess it, which means cops. If they want to come and seize your property and you are operating upon a, a cured, perfected claim of right, they can't use violence to seize it. And the reason is the existence of one excludes the other. You cannot have two parties both with the power to use violence to seize one property. We're not, we're not fighting cocks in a ring here. We're not here to, to bring them pleasure by watching us fight. The fact that I can use violence to protect my property means nobody else has a right to use or threaten the use of violence to remove it from me. When you start acting on a claim of right, when you start acting on a claim of right, from that point forward, you are the one in power. You are now, instead of going to your employers and asking them permission to engage in an action, you are now claiming the right to engage in that action without asking them permission. Now who has the power? They can't remove it from you because it's a claim, it's not a permission. I have an enormous understanding of the law. It took me a lot of time to get here. The good thing about the notice of understanding and intent, you don't need the same level of understanding. Whatever understanding you have now is enough for you to act upon. If you recognize this is too confusing and I don't understand it, that could be your notice of understanding. Here's what I understand. I don't understand any of your words. That's good enough. Some of the words that I never found in their act, three words that I searched for, never found them anywhere. Love, compassion, and truth. Try to find those in any statute, regulation, order, or bylaw. You aren't finding them. If, however, you choose to live your life with love, compassion, and truth as your guiding principles, who are they to claim that this body of words has anything to do with you? They're not. A notice of understanding and intent can be as, as big or as small as you want to make it. I like to make it big so that there's all these different points on it. And in our packages over here, we do have an example of one. Essentially what you're doing is you are going to, this is what it looks like, notice of understanding, intent, claim of right, and a fee schedule. A fee schedule is essentially when, you, when a government agent, a cop or anything, starts and uh, puts an order upon you. They've got a gun there. You're going to be doing what they tell you to do. However, they might not have the legal right to do it, but they've certainly got force. You don't want to get beat up. So what you're doing is you're going to operate under protest and duress. Um, i got two minutes, and we're going to take a break and change the, uh, the tape there. If you are operating under protest and duress, someone comes and says, you clean my floor over here, and you say, show me a contract. No, I've got a gun. Okay, good enough, but that's not a contract. It's going to get your floor clean, but you have three days after I wash your floor to show me a contract that says that I have an obligation to wash your floor and that you have a right to use a gun to get that con contract fulfilled. If you don't do that within three days, guess who gets to determine the terms of that contract? You. That's what the protest means. You are protesting it, you're operating under duress, but then you get to decide, well, I charge $1,000 per square foot for cleaning your floor. <laughs> there you go, here's my bill. When you give them, when you tell them I'm operating under protest and duress, they will say noted. If they refuse to note it, you know that they're scared. And I've had, I'm not noting that, okay, that's fine. But every time I've ever done it, I've done protest and duress. So then I got the cop, number 2191. I got him put on notice because I was operating under protest and duress. I have a record of doing that. And then when he arrested me, I told him and he refused to note it. No, I'm not putting that in. Well, sorry, I've got history as doing this. So when I come up and I wrote up and I said, I operated under protest and duress and he wouldn't accept my protest. That cop was in shit. He can't lie like that. Any questions while we change the tape? Okay, well, we're, we're moving back on. One of the things, 
Using a notary uh, notice of understanding and intent. If you are going to do this, you need a notary public. The purpose of the notary public is to help you avoid conflict. You can use a lawyer to win conflict. You use a notary public so you can avoid conflict. In the Freeman package, there, there is directions to a notary public. Now, I've had trouble trying to get notaries to do what I want them to do. I've had a few that tell me, oh, well, although the, the act says that they may protest or attest or protest any commercial or other instruments, they try pointing out and saying, oh, the word is may and therefore it's permissive, therefore I don't have to do it. My argument with them at that point was, and they tried claiming, oh, I don't know how to do it. I said, well, they've given you permission to do something, something that's very important to us, and yet you haven't even gone out of your way to figure out how to do that yet? I think you should lose your notary license. Okay, she reached in the bottom of her drawer, pulled out an, a protest stamp. She had it all along. They just don't want to do the protest. They have to do it. We've got a great notary public now. I imagine you could use him if you needed to go to Vancouver. His name's Quan. He had... Um, he had his oath up on the wall, and he, had a, he also had a Christian quote. So I asked him, I said, so you believe in Christ? He said, I sure do. I said, and you believe you took your oath seriously? Sure did. He said, you know the, the Queen's oath? Oh, yeah. I said, so uh, you're protecting the faith is what you're doing. When you protest instruments, you are protecting Jesus' faith. You're protecting my faith. And when I tried telling him, okay, I need you to do this, he was like, well, I don't know that I have that power to do that. I said, check out Section 18 of the Notary Act. They're empowered to do anything under any statute. Any duty or anything that, required, that is required to be done under any statute, they have the power to do it. Need a judge? Get a notary. Need a sheriff? Get a notary. Need a notary? Get a notary. When you point that out to them, you might have to do a little bit of shopping, but have faith, find one who is going to do what you want them to do, and if not, Put them on notice. Serve them a notice of understanding and intent and a claim of right. Because whatever that notary is doing, you can accomplish with three people from your community who are of good standing. Three people can act as your witness and what they create will have just as much power as any notary. So don't let them say, oh, I can't do that for you. You are doing it or I'm going to write a snap nasty letter to the notary society. The Notary Society likes me in BC. They've even invited me to go and speak at one of their conventions or when they get together. They, they lock horns with the Law Society all the time. The Law Society hates them. And they like how I've been empowering them. And they've had lawyers, like I had Quan, uh, uh, he said that he got a phone call telling him that he couldn't do these things. I said, tell him you want it in writing. Never heard back from him. They aren't going to... And the reason is... I'm sure many of you have read um, court, court rulings from the Supreme Court of Canada. In a free and just society, na 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 na. This might be acceptable, na 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 na. Ask yourself this What's the name of your society? Do you have one? There's a maximum law that says if you know not the name of a thing, all knowledge of that thing must perish. If someone tells you, I'm going to my best friend's house, and you say, really? What's your best friend's name? And they go, do they even have a best friend? Believe it or not, any member of a society, every member of a particular society will all do the exact same thing if you ask them the right question. If you ask them, what is the name of your society, every member of that society will say the exact same thing. Societies have names. In British Columbia, it's the Society of Notary Publics of British Columbia, the Law Society of British Columbia. If you are a member of a society, you will have a card. Your picture will be on it. It will have evidence that you've been paying your dues, and you will be able to tell me the name of your society. Now, if you can't even tell me the name of your society, and you know a statute is a legislated rule of a society which has been given the force of law, and you don't have a society, why do these acts have any, any force of law over you? Believe it or not, all of these statutes, they are a legislated rule of a particular society which had been given the force of law, but that's the law society. All of these rules are the rules for the law society, and you can prove it. Only they can make the statutes, the regulations, or the orders. You are not allowed to pen these. If you go into court, 
Only they claim that only they may use these documents or these words. Only they can claim complete understanding of these words. Unless you're a member of that society, you cannot understand these words. Why? Because societies have number of powers. As a society, you can generate and create your own rules, and no one who is not a member of that society is going to have a say in creating those rules. You can claim that no one but a member of that society can understand those rules because you can actually create your own language as a society if you want. And you can do this by taking an existing language, oh, let's call it English, and you can change just a few words, not tell anyone else how those words have been changed. And guess what? You've got an entirely new language that appears to be English, but it's not. And only they know it. And this is the magnificency of the deception. This is why it's so beautiful. When this whole thing unfolds, they think they're going to be fooling God. They think that they're going to lock us up in their cage. No. All they are doing is creating a set of rules that is going to be applicable only to them. We step out of the cage and all of these deceivers, all of the judges, all of the ignorant cops who refuse to look into the meaning of these words, they're the one bound by these rules, not us. This is what I, I kind of see it as the, uh, the wheat and the, the chaff being separated. We are going to create an opportunity where all of us, all of the good people out there, assuming that I'm one, will be fully and completely free. We can have our abundance, but all the people who've been generating all their revenue, been making a very good living off of this deception, they're going to be stuck with that, paying the income tax. There you can't smoke pot. We can. You're in a government employee. We're out of there. And if they ever try stepping out of their little system, the reason, when we all step out, this great big tiger is going to turn into a little kitten. Meow, meow, meow. And the lawyers are going to say, oh, well, you, we, you don't need us here anymore. We're going to go over. No, we saw what you did. You tried to make a cage around us. You are part of that cage forever. You stay there. And if you try stepping out of your cage, guess what happens? You're stepping right into our courts. And you're going to face charges of fraud. So you stay in your box and we're staying in ours. This is why the, magnificent, the deception is so magnificent. It's not going to affect us. It's only going to affect all the deceivers, all the judges, all the cops who refuse to... The people who seek benefit at our expense, oh, payback is going to be a bitch when it comes. And I, I see it coming. And the reason it's going to have to happen is because we don't even have a society. Now, the way I look at it, the law society, the lawyers, they have a proper society. They're making their rules. And if you go and you ask one of these members, is this a law? He can honestly tell you, yes, that's a law. I am bound by that. You will assume that you are too, but actually all he's telling you is all of these rules were created only by members of the law society. Who can they lawfully be applied to? Only members of the law society and those who begged to be, I'll get that. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay, buddy. If you beg for permission, imagine imagine you got a neighbor, your neighbor's got a pool. He tells you you can have full access to my pool whenever you want. Does this mean you're an owner of the pool? No. Do you have a right to complain and bitch about how much chlorine is in there? No. Can he stop you from digging your own pool? No. And once we start digging our own pool, say, no, thank you, I don't need your court system anymore. I don't need your pool anymore. You put too much chlorine in there, and uh, there's something floating. <laughs> <laughs> you get to create your own power, your own situation. This is what they don't like. Uh, we're working on developing and starting our own society. You'll all be invited to join. It's going to be called the Freeman Society of Canada. Now, I know women will say, oh, I want to be a free person. The term free man, the term man, is inclusive. It includes women and men. Right. Although the men used to be called were men way back when. So when they referred to mankind, they were referring to both types of men. So don't get all sensitive about it and say, oh, it's got to be free person, because then you just blow it all to hell anyways. Yeah, free person. No, oh, yeah, yeah. I've had people tell me, why don't you make it a free person society so I can join? <laughs> Because there will be no persons. Now, what I'd like to share with you now is, well, actually using a notary public. The way to deal with the notary public, the directions you're going to be giving them, and it's in our package over here, 
you will go, this, these are the directions that I produced, and when he looked at it, he said, okay, fine, and it ended up, I ended up getting a default judgment, and the only signature on it was the notary's. He wasn't attesting my signature, he was going through it. He is a witness to a process, a process which is evidencing you trying to avoid conflict. We have a lot of remedy given to us by our Savior Jesus Christ. And although I, I consider him my Savior, I consider him my Savior not because I pray to him and I'm going to get to heaven, but because he has taught me so much about the law. In the Bible it tells you if you're on the, your way to court with someone, with your adversary, offer amends before you get to court. Otherwise you can be delivered to the judge, he'll give you to the jailer, and they'll you'll rot. In the Law and Equity Act, they express that if you offer mediation, discussion, or negotiation prior to court and the other party refuses, guess what? They're, they've lost. Your goal with the notary public is to take the responsible, adult, mature steps to avoid conflict. You're trying to avoid shit in your pants, no tantrums, and you're not rebelling. You're just being an adult. Step number one, you will witness the attestation of an affidavit and a notice of understanding and intent and a claim of right. That's his job. He's got to do it anyways. You will open up a file in your office, and therein you will keep all the originals of these documents. He can do that. You will create certified true copies of those documents and you will serve those or you will cause them to be served or you will give them to me and I'll serve them on this party. Then I will come back with a certificate of service and give it to you. Um, you will wait 10 days from the date of service in order to give the affected parties a chance to either accept the claim silently or send you a sworn and attested affidavit created upon their full commercial liability and who's going to touch that? What government agent is going to step into that? They don't want to go there. Uh, if they don't do that, if within 10 days you receive her, you receive a proper affidavit contesting the claims made, you will contact me and then you will inform me of this contact, of this contest. But if there is no, if there is an absence of contest, then you will in, uh, create and sign a default judgment. And then we got the, the notar notary to do that. And it's all within... I think what he liked about us, the reason we, we pulled him to this is because he sees that what we're doing is actually very positive for the government and he doesn't like what's happening yet either. I mean, he told us, I sure wish I could operate outside the box. This guy is so unhappy with the government and there's a lot of people out there like that. So essentially all you're doing is you're holding that notary to be your witness and all you are doing is extending an offer to discuss, you're expressing your understanding, you're expressing your intent. There's an implied offer to discuss. If they don't accept that, you lose. The notary is my witness. He's going to sign a default judgment under the authority that's been granted to him under Section 18. Then you can take this. And we've we brought these in court before. Someone told me they brought it in court. And uh, when it was mentioned to the judge about Section 18, he went, oh, yeah, I'm familiar with that. They know exactly. The notary is the joker in the deck. They have all the power in the world. When you're playing these, these games with the government, the way I look at it, it's like a chess game. Who here has played chess? Anyone? Okay. What is the very first move in a chess game? If you want to win, you are going to have to make this one first move every time, and if you don't make this move, I guarantee you lose. Anyone? This is not a rhetorical question. Now's the time, smart boy. <laughs> what is the move? No, you put your pieces on the board. If you never put your pieces on the board, if you show up with a king and a pawn and all their pieces are on the board, which is what they want you to do in court, you're going to lose. If, however, you start saying, okay, here's my pieces, do do do, you, they start seeing that you know how the game is played, then it becomes more powerful. Then they, they start looking and, oh, man, we don't want to play with this guy. It's going to get too difficult. Now, here's a funny thing. You let them act first. They're the moving party. They put their pieces on the board. Okay, now it's my turn. I put my queen dead center. You can't do that. You have to put your pieces back here. Says who? You put your pieces on the board where you want them. I get to put my pieces on the board where I want them. <laughs> then you place your pieces so they can't even move. <laughs> Guess who won the game? What, you can't move? Hi, you lose. Remember to put your pieces on the board. If you aren't doing a proper notice of understanding and intent, if you're not claiming a right, you don't even have your queen on that board. You're going to get your 
your butt handed to me. You're not going to win that game. Some of the, the strategies that I found for dealing with cops that seem to work. One, make sure you always recognize you are dealing with a human being. These are human beings that they don't know the law any more, any more than you do, likely. They don't really... I found that people who benefit from any societal mechanism rarely wish, rarely wish to understand that mechanism, especially if it's going to... if understanding it limits their power over you. They will always interpret these words in a manner that maximizes their claim of authority over you. If, however, you remember they're human beings, you treat them with love, you treat them with the compassion that we are all worthy of, we are all due a certain amount of compassion, well, if they do have to arrest you and bring violence, they don't take you down, they don't beat you up, they don't cuff, the, cuff you really hard, they will treat you with uh, the respect that you give them. Especially if, before going in there and asking them these questions, you have filed documents, you've served a notice of understanding and intent, a claim of right, and most importantly, you have a fee schedule filed. The fee schedule, my fee schedule states that if I'm stopped by a cop for statutory uh, compliance checks or anything like that, if they're respectful, I don't, I'm not going to activate my fee schedule. But otherwise, if they make demands upon me, I get paid $200 an hour, and I'm going to collect. I'll use my notary to collect, and they know I can achieve these things. If they arrest me, if they try to take me away, seize me, put cuffs on me, 2000 bucks an hour or a portion thereof. And my notary, I let him know about this. He, yeah, I will help you do that. You can get a notary judgment that the sheriffs will respond to. I went and I asked a sheriff. I said, if I had a default judgment authorizing me to seize property and it was signed by a notary and not a judge, no, nope, we would accept that. And they will go out and help you seize property. Some of the things that I do when I'm talking with a cop, first of all, I never give them, if they ask for my name, I say, well, legal or lawful, I want to know. And I don't have a legal one. You ask them, under what authority are you acting? If they try saying, I'm a cop, <laughs> so what? Under what authority are you acting? If they try saying it's against the law, and I've had them do that before, oh, it's against the law, what law? The Controlled Drugs and Substance Act. That's an act and a statute, not a law. Are you aware gross negligence is equal to fraud? <sighs> they hate that. These people have a duty to understand and to distinguish between statute and law. They've been dealing with us for so long with people who are essentially ignorant that we don't even distinguish between statute and law, so they assume that you are going to be there. They'll say, oh, you broke this statute, you broke a law, I want to give you a ticket. And then they'll say, I need to see your ID, and if you don't show me ID, I'm going to arrest you for obstruction of justice. I've had cops do this to me, SkyTrain cops. The fact is, though, until they see ID, they have absolutely no evidence of the existence of a person who is, re who is liable under the statute. So they're putting the cart before the horse. They're saying, I see a human being. Uh, the act says person must produce a proof affair. You're a person. I'm giving you a ticket. Now you have to show me your ID so I can give you a ticket because they've been told if you don't see ID, you can't give a ticket. They know this, but they're putting the cart before the horse. Ask them flat out, is this a transaction of a security interest? If he says, I don't know, then you say, well, clearly it can't be. You cannot engage in a transaction of a security interest in ignorance. So you say, okay, fine, so this isn't a transaction of a security interest. If it is, you need knowledge thereof. Since it's not a transaction of a security interest, you will not be generating any obligation upon me to pay or perform, so why am I talking to you? Have a good day. If they say, yes, it is a transaction of a security interest, you need my consent for that, and I do not consent to your transaction of a security interest. If they ask you for identification, do what my friend Digger did. He said, why do I have to show you ID when I'm not even obliged to have it, but you are. They need to show you three things upon demand, if you demand it. Their identification card. It'll be signed by the Solicitor General. Their badge is usually right there. They will have a business card. If they don't have a business card with their name and badge number that matches their ID card, you do not know you're dealing with a proper cop. And I've caught cops wearing fake numbers and giving out fake, uh, fake cards. It doesn't jive. It does, you need all three. And when you see all three of those, then you know you're dealing with an officer who is in uniform. If he doesn't show you that, he's out of uniform, I don't have evidence that you're actually a real cop, and I'm not listening to you. And if you order me to do anything, it's under protest and duress. If he asks, if he, if, later, if you get a chance, 
Afterwards, please. What? It was the third thing. The badge, ID, and business card. Thank you. Um, ask him, are you giving me an order? And it, hope he says yes. Really, that makes you liable for a bill. <laughs> they hate this. If they try, if they come up to you and they, what they like to do, they, they use presumption and assumption so often, they won't even ask you a question. They come to the window, driver's license, registration, insurance, look at them and say, uh, apples, bananas, and pears? <laughs> You're not making any sense. Like, you used a complete sentence? What is it you want? Do you have a driver's license, registration, and insurance? Or may I see it, is usually what they would ask, because they're operating upon a presumption too. You ask them, are you willing to claim under full commercial liability that I have an obligation to have such a thing in order to exercise my common law rights? Uh, blah, blah, blah. And of course you don't. And they are learning about it. Is that in your package? Yep. <laughs> now, if they ask you, or if they try, try to enforce a statutory obligation or restraint upon you, they are, trying, they are going to try to establish the evidence of a person. They want to see ID. They'll ask you, what's your last name? If you give a last name instead of a family name, they can assume that you are a person. One of the key things to a person, they need two things. They need a name and a date of birth. Without that date of birth, they have no claim that there's a person. Anytime a cop asks me, when were you born? Sorry, I wasn't counting then. <laughs> really wish I could help you. I've had cops say, okay, fair enough. Um, when do you celebrate your birthday? I do that every day. <laughs> okay, good enough. If I wanted to send you a gift for your birthday, when should I do that? Tomorrow sounds good. You're late. <laughs> you don't give them that information because you don't know that information. There is no way on earth you could possibly prove in a court of law that you know when you were born. Even anyone tells you it's all hearsay. What they can establish was born was the legal fiction, that person. That you can point to, and you can point exactly when that was born. They create it. So the person is the legal fiction. The person is that legal fiction. If they try enforcing statutory obligations or restraints upon you, ask them. They'll say, oh, well, let me see your ID. Well, what evidence do you have at this point right now that you are actually dealing with a person who is subject to that act? Until they see the ID, they don't know. And I've heard stories. There was a guy who, he had his, his card, he got stopped, he had a driver's license. The cops are there and they're asking him, do you have a driver's license? And he's playing with them and, you know, I'm, I'm not producing that. I don't know why you stopped me. Nah, nah, nah. Cops are totally nice to him. He's about to get, he, he says, you know, I was this far to getting out of there. They were just going to give up. And then finally the cop asked me one last time, you sure you don't want to just show me your ID? I mean, it makes it, okay, fine. I, the moment they saw it, Right out the window. They dragged him right out the window. They put the cuffs on him, took him away. He was this close. But once they saw that there was a person they could act upon, they acted. And they, they will act very, very quickly, especially if you're being pokey with them. Try not to be too pokey against the guys with guns. That's one of the things that's helped me get this far. Number one. Cops do, Absolutely. I have been talking, well, in the last five years, I've been working very hard to help educate them. And I write a lot of letters. But I've had cops who have acknowledged me, and they know me quite well. And uh, I've talked to cops about other things. This information has gotten out there. I've had a couple of, uh, one, one officer came, and uh, he asked, I expressed this to him. He said, that can't be true. I said, you go ahead and find out. And you certainly have a duty to do diligence anyways now, so you have a duty to go ask. Next time I saw him, he had been promoted, and he was in... Uh, he was in plain clothes, and he, I really th appreciate the information you gave me. They, they bump them up. They, so it's not the training that they get. That it's it's not the training they get, but... The person they cannot act or whatever. Yeah, and they understand it. I've had cops tell me uh, when I gave them a guy's name, they said, well, the problem is there's two of him. And I went, what do you mean, there's two people? No, there's uh, the person and there's the people, and uh, just so you know, there's two of them. I said, so you're aware of the person. We're aware. They, they know. And that's why they are wanting us to get to the point. Nanny wants us to grow up. 
these a lot of these cops i've had many cops well three cops have told me in probably the last year you know if there were more people like you we wouldn't need to enforce all these bullshit laws i said i'm working on it buddy i'm working on it they they don't want to do this they they don't understand what these words mean anyways they don't want the conflict they want the peace and they want the abundance as well they would love to be loved they would like to be looked at like they're good firemen like they're your best friends what if a cop that searches you without permission and finds id showing you are a person such as a sin or a dl or whatever why 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 do you have it okay so you're saying don't yeah don't and it. leave it at home unless you're using your person that day you leave it at home and if they search you, again, it's under protest and duress. It has to be a lawful search. And if you have abandoned your sin, they have no authority over you whatsoever unless they observe you breach the peace or someone comes and makes an actual accusation against you. Okay. So. No, no, later. Okay. Later. Clint, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, for the most part, if you're acting with respect towards them, you're acting within your own community standards, and all you're doing is asking them questions. You're not, I mean, there are some things you can't say to the cops. If they come and they ask you for driver's license, right, or if they say, do you know why I stopped you? It's usually not a good idea to say something like, because you're a power-hungry, tax-collecting tool of the state bully with a badge and a gun, and by stopping me, you get to exercise your powers, propping up your own frail ego, allowing you to believe for a short period of time you're not half the loser you really are. <laughs> you don't say stuff like that. It's not going to help you. That's not the truth. These cops, for the most part, these are decent human beings who are trying and who would come and risk their life for you. They could give you a ticket and argue with you about the law one minute, Five minutes later, they could be pulling you out of a burning wreck, and they, they would put their life on the line. And when you bring them this energy, instead of saying, oh, fucking copper, if you treat them as, hello, peace officer, I love you, <laughs> what can they do? They, you know, and if you can learn to distinguish between a law enforcement officer and a peace officer, hold them to their peace officer status, and refuse to allow them to act as a law enforcement officer against you because they have nothing to enforce, they love it. They, oh man, good for you. I don't have to be an, I'm not your nanny. You're good. Okay, fine. I get to go find some real criminals. In court, some things that we can do in court. First of all, don't ever accuse yourself. If you go in there, and this is one of the key things I found when we were with Rob in court. We asked the prosecutor, will you please identify the accused party? She asked us, are you going to be taking part in this? I, she almost said charade, charade. She said, are you going to be taking part in this? I said, will you please identify the accused party? Oh. Just walked away. We ended up, we got it on the record that Robert Scott Christie was in the courtroom, but the accused was not. And that was good enough for us. They will ask you, what's your name? It's none of your business unless and until you've accused me. They want you to give the name. They say, okay, you're the accused. Come on up here. You're stepping right into it. You can say, I'm not giving you any name whatsoever unless somebody accuses me. So, do you know my name? No? Well, then clearly I can't be an accused party, can I? You step right into it. They will refuse to identify you as an accused party for any statutory or summary action. They can't and won't do it because it's only against the fiction. It exists in association with you. That association must be lawful and therefore it must be voluntary on your part. They will ask you, what's your name? Okay, Mr. Menard, please step forward. You're faced with these charges. Oh, well, yeah, apparently. Okay, you just accused yourself. A friend of mine, Greg Calcutta, he held up his summons. He, he's standing there. What's your name? I'm here to deal with this number. Well, I need your name. I'm here to deal with this number. And that's all he did. Stood his ground. I'm here to deal with this number. Okay, we can't. They never called his name. They never did anything. And then it just got wiped. It was gone. Another tactic that works very well in court, and I saw this, I, I thought it was the most beautiful thing on the world, in the world. Uh, Lutz, Brian Lutz, L-U-T-E-S. You can look it up if you want. He was charged under the Income Tax Act with failure to file. It's not, it's not you who has to pay this income tax. It's your person, of course. It's your account that you set up with your social insurance number. This means they have to create joinder between you and this number. They, uh, if you send them a document saying, hi, my social insurance number is 47, eh, you've used it, you're in it. 
He never allowed them to create any joinder between the two. But when we went up in court, we go up in court and little aside, I'm testifying. They put my hand on the Bible. They say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I went, no. And the judge looks at me. I said, I'm sorry, good sir, but I can't swear to tell the whole truth. I don't know the whole truth. If I did, my name would be in this good book and not my hand upon it. I said, I don't think anyone knows the whole truth. I think if anyone did, I think they're insane. But I will promise to speak to you the truth that I know, and I won't leave anything out. But that's about all I can do for you, good sir. Okay, that's good enough for me. At this point, what they'll try to do is they'll try to take that Bible right away from you. Don't let them. Keep it. And when they say, okay, well, according to Section 38 of the Income Tax Act, you go, what page are we on? <laughs> oh, I swore on this, Your Honor. You're not holding me to anything else. This is the one we're using. You want me to swear on the Income Tax Act? Try bringing that up. So you can do that. That Bible is very powerful. You don't have to let it go. And this is what they, they'll... They give you a shield, they take it right away from you. And they can say, oh, well, we gave him a shield, but he lost it. That Bible is your protection. Hold it up between them. Stay away, stay away. <laughs> if prior to going into court, you have served a notice of understanding and intent and a claim of right, and this claim of right is you're claiming the right to serve a bill upon anyone who would possibly or give you any orders, when you go in there and the judge tries giving you an order, I'm looking for orders. I'm here to fill your orders because i got a big book of bills right here. Go in there with bills already made. Whatever order they give you, multiply, throw a zero on it. There you go. How long do you have before you can do that? Right then, immediately. But do you have some time? you have two days, three days? Or? Well, for the, uh, I imagine you would be able to present them a bill, but normally you present a bill immediately upon service or cessation of services. Do you not? Like if think of a restaurant. You go into a restaurant, even if it's a fast food restaurant, you're giving your order, you're liable for the bill, you pay that bill, the order is fulfilled. If you go to a regular restaurant, you can place an order, and they're trusting you. They could, if they wanted, demand payment for that prior to fulfilling. Yeah, they could if they wanted, but they're just being nice because they want tips. Hey, Clint was in there. So, recognize that them giving you orders isn't necessarily a bad thing. And the moment you hit them with one bill for one order, I guarantee you they are going to go way out of their way to never give you another order. <laughs> they, and a very little known fact in, in Canada, because Canada is a common law jurisdiction, we're all equal. Nobody has the right to enforce adjudication services upon you. I went and I listened to uh, Beverly McLaughlin, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. She stated very clearly, right on the record, people... Uh, no one can provide adjudication services without the consent of both parties to the adjudication. They need your consent. It's a transaction of a security interest. We're all equal. They might be a little bit sneakier, but that doesn't make them morally better than you so that they can order you around and dictate your actions. Therefore, you always have the right to respectfully decline to accept their judgment. And the, the uh, Canadian government did this. The first time I saw it, the Canadian government we respectfully decline to accept this court's judgment, and you can do that too. And the, Okay, fine, that was my thing. Because bear in mind, there is no real society. If you read these judgments, they say, well, in a free and just society, yeah, name it. They all talk in hypotheticals. And if you're not a member of the law society, you're not bound by these words. All these lawyers are. If you go into court, bring the Law and Equity Act. They hate that. You can bring that, show it to them, and say, yep, this is the Law and Equity Act. I intend to use it. I'm going to find my remedy because no matter what you say, I've got three days to say no. They don't like this. And uh, when, when we went in with, uh, with Rob, and I've gone in with a couple of people, and I, I tried to tell the JP, well, we're going to use Law and Equity. No Law and Equity Act in here. I'm not hearing anything about Equity and Law Act or anything like this. And he was just so shooken by that. And the reason is because you, it's, it's the monopoly bat. You can just clear his entire bench with it, and he ends up liable. Again, they're human beings. They're in a common law jurisdiction. They can't, they're liable too. They aren't given full 
complete uh, freedom from liability for their actions. If they're committing a fraud, one of the remedies you have as a plaintiff is to bring action against them. You have all the remedy that would have been available to you in 1876. This means you have a right to bring action against them as well. Ask them as well. Are you offering me a transaction of a security interest? Get this on the record. Label it as a security interest. Label it as a transaction. Even if they ask for your name, a security interest can be an intangible. Anything that generates an obligation or a duty to perform is a security interest. Your name could be viewed as one. If a cop asks you, what's your name? That's an intangible security interest, actually, and why do you want it? What am I getting in return? Judges hate it when you ask them, is this a transaction of a security interest? If they say no, you can just walk out. If they say yes, you've got them right over the barrel. One of the things they're doing when you get in court, if they're acting upon your legal entity, upon your legal fiction, you come up and they are. if you answer for this name, they are assuming that you are acting as surety for the charged party, for the accused. That's why you're moving. That's why you're acting. Go in there and say, even if you have to give them your name, whatever, just tell them, equality before and under the law is mandatory. You and me, we're equal. I don't know why you're sitting up there, judgy wudgy. Equality before the law is mandatory. Uh, I'm competent to administrate my own affairs. I do not consent to this transaction. He has no power after that. He can't do anything. He'll try to railroad you. He'll try to get you to appear to change your, your position and opinion. Stick to your position. Stick to your guns over and over. Tell them right off. I, tell them, I am not surety for the accused, although our names are very familiar. Oh, really? What's your name? Why do you care? I'm not the accused and I'm not surety. That's all you need to know. I'm just here as a, pub, a member of the public observant. The big one. Ask them for their oath and their bond information. They're an officer of the court. If they're an officer, they're holding office. Offices have oaths. Ask them to put their oath on the record and their bond information. The bond information is uh, who issued the bond, what's the value of that bond, and who is holding it in trust for redemption. The bond is a piece of paper. Essentially what they got to do is they have to act on their bond. They're standing on a piece of paper which is worth a million dollars and they can't step off that paper. They cannot operate outside of the realm of that bond. If they do, you get to say, hey, look, someone abandoned a million dollars. <laughs> Thank you very much. You take this bond. If you get your hands on that actual bond, you take the original to the issuing agency. It's a check for that amount. They have to honor it. That's what the bond is for. If they don't have that, if they don't have the oath and the bond and they don't want to put it clearly on the record, you can tell them you're not holding office lawfully. You can also give them their oath. You can, I'll tell you what your oath is then if you don't want to enter it in the record. You've had success in this, have you not, Mary? Where you, uh, <clears throat> you, told, you, you put their oath on the record? Yeah, I accept their oath into the matter. So poke them on that. The big trick is what I found, <clears throat> it's a bit of work because you've got to get, you got to find the path where you're loving and you're gentle and you're respectful to their office, but at the same time, you are just not going to take any shit from anyone. You know there's too much deception. You can't, you can't put poo between bread and call it a sandwich and not make it not stink because of the bread. It's still stinky shit and I'm not eating it. If you go through this enough times, they recognize it and they say, I don't even want to do this anymore. Especially if every time you go through so one of their processes, you say, okay, I accept that. Doesn't this mean that then? <laughs> if you learn every time you go through it, it gets to a point where they don't want you to go through anymore because you're arming yourself every time you go through it. You're just understanding their process better. And if you're a big loudmouth like I am, they know that I'll start telling people everything I learn. Okay, I'm telling people about that one. Oh, damn it. <laughs> In order to find your free man status, you will need to distinguish. There is a, there are a maxim in law that says, he who distinguishes well, learns well. He who questions well, learns well. If you cannot question, you cannot distinguish, you are going to end up being a slave to them. The reason questioning is so powerful, if they ask you a question, you ask them a question right back. We're equal. We're playing tennis. The goal is to get them to answer the question first, answer none of their questions. The reason is... 
If you are trying, if you are asking questions, the assumption in law must be that you are asking because you don't understand and you want to understand so you can keep the law. The assumption is, and therefore, as long as you are continually asking questions, they can't do anything. They can't claim you're obstructing justice. They can't claim that you're not, uh, that you're in violation of any statute. Just keep asking questions. Lutz, when he was in court, this was clever. He would be asked a question, and he would sit there four minutes. <laughs> what does that word mean, and from where did you get the definition? And the prosecutors, Your Honor, are you going to allow this? You asked him a question, his freedom is on the line, and I think he's being very wise thinking about your questions before answering. <laughs> The judge loved him. We, and this judge, I mean, this was after I had been on the stand, so he kind of liked me and my response. And uh, Lutz said something very telling, said something along the lines of, well, I don't understand the Income Tax Act, or I don't stand under the Income Tax Act. And the, the judge said, well, what do you mean? I said, he said, I don't understand it, I don't stand under it, I don't grasp it, comprehend it, or seize it. I don't understand it. The judge said, welcome to the club. <laughs> Right there I said, we won, we won. How can you claim you don't understand the act and then use that? And you should have seen the prosecutor's head at that time. <laughs> if you learn to distinguish between actual law, and there is only three ways to break the law, harm another human being, damage someone else's property, use fraud or mischief in your contracts, you have broken the law. That's the only way to break the law. If you distinguish between statutes and law, you're, you're on your way. You need to distinguish between these. If you can distinguish between the city of Edmonton, which is actually properly called the corporation of the city of Edmonton, and Edmonton City, you can distinguish between the legal entity, which is where all the bylaws are, because if you look up definition of bylaw, you know what it says? Rule of a corporation. So why are these corporations imposing these rules upon you if you let them know, I'm not even, oh yeah, I'm walking down the street in Vancouver City, but that doesn't mean I'm a person in the corporation of the city of Vancouver. We went in, I've got a little vest with a hidden video camera on it. We went in and uh, we served notice on the chief licensing officer, or chief bylaw enforcement officer in the corporation of the city of Vancouver. And when I say serve notice, I mean we served a notice. Oh, yeah, we walked right up. Hey, we got a notice for you just to make sure you can see it. And here's a jar of olives. God's peace to you. Okay, no, we see it. Thank you. <laughs> said, okay, so we're planning on opening up a little place. We're going to call it Shepherd's Haven. We're going to uh, sell beer, wine, and what's that other thing? Oh, yeah, pot. <laughs> you don't have a problem with that? No, we have no problem, Mr. Menard. You don't need to talk to us anymore. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fine. If you distinguish between driving and traveling, a driver is someone who is engaging in commerce on the highway and is paying for it. They'll point to the driver's seat and a passenger seat. What if you're just traveling and your passenger is actually a guest? If you can distinguish between driver, guest, passenger, and owner, that's when you start finding your, your, your freedom there as well. I'm not a driver, I'm not engaging in commerce, and I'm not asking you for a license. If you distinguish between an enforcement officer and a peace officer, a peace officer's duty is to keep the peace. Uh, an enforcement officer's duty is to enforce either court orders or statutory, uh, ensure statutory compliance. They are breaching, their primary role is the peace officer. And they are actually breaching their duty to the peace if they try to act as an enforcement officer without actually having evidence of person status. Hold them to that. Distinguish between those. If you can distinguish between de facto and de jure, de facto means, okay, we're there, but we're fraudulent. We're fulfilling these duties just because no one else is. But it's actually fraudulent. De jure means it's done under law. It's a proper lawful court. Ask the courts. You know what they hate? Is this a de facto court? You're actually asking them, is this a fraudulent court? And it is a de facto court, and they have to answer it. Person and human being, and... Uh, the owner and a limited access user. Now it boils down another question that they hate. Whose courts are these? They'll try telling you, oh, these courts are yours. Really? Do I have full and complete access? 
Ownership is determined by access. An owner to property has full, unconditional access to their property. If you only have limited access to that property, you cannot claim to be an owner. You don't have full and complete access to any of these courts because you do not have a right to create the acts that are being used. You don't have the power to file documents and you are, you are barred from earning a gain or a fee or a reward from acting as an agent for anyone in court. Now, if this is the case and there's another party that does have fuller access to the courts, who do they belong to? What if these courts are just private courts for the law society that you are making use of because they get you into their little deception? They've created a box for themselves, said this is the law for us, but we assume that it's the law for everyone. Any questions? Which yep. one? Whoever. If you abandon that corporation, it's the corporation that's liable, not you, or the legal fiction. And, and that's, then that's the, the required step that happens over and over. No, the notice of understanding and intent and a claim of right is what you will be doing over and over, essentially. So and you want to, you want to uh, abandon the corporation, you want to deregister your car. That's what I suggest. Some people uh, would say, well, you know, I want to keep this. There, there's some benefits involved. And my question I would ask then is, when have you ever in your life benefited from a deception that was imposed upon you? If what they're selling is such a good thing, why do they have to use so much deception? Because I, <clears throat> my, understanding, my understanding before I came to this meeting or anything, I agree with what you said. So you're a newbie. You're virgin. Distinguish between drive and travel. You are free to travel, but you shouldn't be free to drive because that means you're going to use public resources to earn a living and to generate a profit. <clears throat> so if you distinguish between drive and travel, if you're just saying, I want to go from point A to point B and I'm not earning any money by carrying a passenger, I'm not carrying any cargo for someone else, you're traveling and you do have every right in the world to do that, and it's av made available to you if you claim if you serve a notice of understanding and intent and claim your right to do it. Because it strikes me that all the laws, etc. Statutes, you mean? I don't know. Um, all, all, all the things that are, that are there that we think are laws, etc. I came to the conclusion that in fact it was the reverse. It was there to protect uh, my right to, to live a full life, a, a, a free life. These are the rules of government agents. These are the rules that exist so that we can have a measure of control over the government. They've hooped us into getting a social insurance number, so now we're all part of the government. We're all bound by these rules, but we can step away at any time. And when we do, we're free of these rules. They're still bound by them. You tell them you don't have one. And if you sense that, oh, they're going to want this, they're going to want that, all you have to do is see that this is a potential for conflict, and you take care of that by creating and signing a notice of understanding and intent. Serve, put them on notice. Claim your right. Watch what happens. Because the, the lenders, of course, never have to enter into a They don't have to any money if I don't satisfy it. That's a whole different story. You've got, my friend, there's a whole lot you should learn before you go buying property like that because chances are you can just discharge it anyways. Send me this other one. So I said to him, 
I was born in Medicine Hat. My mom and dad named me Merle Grant Schnee. And uh, I want to replace the birth certificate, but just so that you know uh, that I'm not the one that I'm looking for, I'm sending you one, a copy in this exhibit one. And I paid for it and everything else, so please send me the exact copy. Well, now, when I got it, of course, I didn't have the exact copy. It had my last name first. Yeah, yeah. They used to give capital letters in Alberta, but there's so many people here, like Gordon and Vernon Ray's Pell, that they changed that. Instead of capitals now, they just use our last name first, or certain. Right. So I'm going to court in the Duke, and I've got my birth certificate the way it should be, the other birth certificate the way the government gave it to me, and I got the ticket that's all capitals. So I said to the judge, which one do you want? Now, she wasn't happy with me. She said, unless you tell me that you're here, or something, I'm going to find you absent uh, or guilty in absence or whatever. Yep. So I'm standing there looking at her, and she, she pronounced me guilty and then told me to get the hell out. Fine, I'm guilty. Bye. Or you just, again, three days. This is a transaction of a security interest. And oh, one, someone asked a question about uh, the social insurance number. If you abandon it, what about retirees? Can you still get your pension payment? Because apparently what the government does is they insist that you use the social insurance number. If you have, uh, again, it would require notice of understanding and intent. And the way I look at it, my dad worked for Chrysler for 30 years. Well, he worked for Chrysler for 30 years. He had a Chrysler employee identification number. When he retired, he gave up his number. He started collecting his pay pension. You should be able, if you're retired and you're collecting a pension, you should be able to give them back that social insurance number and still claim the right to collect your pension. You shouldn't have to be a government employee from the day you're born to the day you die. You can say, I'm no longer a government employee, but that's my pension and you're going to give it to me. And what if you could ask for it all at once? I want my whole pension. Um, without SIN or a birth certificate, how do you get a passport? Uh, again, I thought we, we covered that already. Uh, I don't know that you'd need a passport. Again, a notice of understanding and intent. You write to the... Co what the government is doing is providing you with a service and saving you the trouble of having to do it all yourself. Do what the government would do with that passport, but do it yourself. And essentially all you're doing is you, you, would, you could en engage in, a, in a, an agreement with the, uh, the host country, you tell them, listen, I want to come and visit this country and uh, I'm a free man on the land and because of that, I don't have a passport. Or you could demand that the passport office provide you with a passport even as a free man on the land. They might say, oh, you need this, you need this. We're required to see this. I, I hate it. When, well, I don't hate it, but I notice a lot of times they will say ICBC is required to see this application. I require a tuna sandwich. Does that create an obligation on any of you to give me one? No. Just because they define it as their requirement doesn't mean it's an obligation for you. The law is all about remedy. There is always remedy. If you can't find the remedy, you're not thinking about law. You're not looking at it properly. It's always there. There are people who travel, uh, they cross the, especially coming into our border. You can come into our border, say, I'm a free man on the land. You're a government agent. Get the hell out of my way. Just move. If you're going into other countries, you're going to have to operate on an agreement of good behavior, essentially is what that passport is for. Uh, maybe post a bond, say oh, I'm posting a $10,000 bond in order to travel and, and explain this to them. And although you won't be able to serve a notice of understanding and intent and a claim of right upon a foreign company or a foreign jurisdiction, you can certainly do it to, to uh, the customs people here. And they, they know that they have no right to deny you access. And a, a, uh, I've heard of people using a family Bible, and they claim that that's their ID, that's their passport, and uh, it's accepted. And that's what they used to use before passports.
I don't want to play this game. I don't. So, and then I've learned. I've also learned, obviously, that these words I can't understand. These words. These are words written in another language. You have to be a lawyer to understand them. I can't understand them. How can I, in any conscience whatsoever, be bound by something I can't understand? And secondly, there are thousands of pages of documents and stuff. And it's like, well, how easy is this? This was made for us and it's supposed to help us, and it's ours, and we made it so we can't even understand it. So anyway, Rob's going to talk about the whole lawyers and all that stuff in, later on, but, but I can't understand it. There's no way that I can understand it unless I'm a member of the bar, so I'm not going to be bound by it. And um, so we go into court, and, uh, and I go in as a free man. I've done all my stuff. Uh, Rob walks in. The, law, the judge right away says, we can't hear you. Um, so then we go outside with the prosecutor, and she says, well... Or she, she says, are you going to come in? I said, well, what's your name? I need your bar card. I need this information. And are you, uh, are you uh, claiming that I'm the accused or the charged party or whatever we said? And she wouldn't say anything. She just laughs. and She walks back into the courtroom. And so we get into the courtroom, and they start their trial, an ex parte trial while I'm sitting in there. And they're not pointing to me as the accused party. So I'm thinking, great. They're not, I'm, in, I'm in the courtroom. They're looking for a guy named Christy Robert Scott, and they're, they're going through the thing. And... They're not looking at me, so I'm not the guy they want. So this is part of my, this is how I won. I, they don't want to talk to me. They don't want to talk. When they said they don't want to talk to Rob, I'm like, great. Isn't that awesome? They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to talk to me. I told my dad the whole story, and after months of years of arguing and, and the whole thing, he's like, well, isn't that what you wanted? And I was like, oh, you got that. Yeah, that's what I wanted. I don't want them to talk to me. I don't want to have any a part of them because... I can't understand it, and my conscience doesn't dictate that I should be a part of fraud and all that stuff. So, so that's where I am anyway. Uh, and uh, it's been a, it's been quite a journey. Uh, I've learned a lot in the last little while, and uh, and it's been uh, it's been a, it's been an honor to work with Rob and uh, and a pain, you know. He's, but that's okay. We we all accept each other for what we are. So uh, anyway. Rob Menard is the next guy you're going to hear, and it's an honor to introduce him to you. And so are you coming back out here? It's all good. Everybody, if we could have a massive hand for Robert Arthur Menard Freeman on the land, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Clint. Folks, let's keep it going for Clint and uh, Robert Christie over there. And also, while we're here, we, we've got a whole lot of giants in the movement here. We've got Mary Elizabeth Croft right here. Let's have a round of applause for her, folks. If you haven't read her book, you can check it out on the Internet. I, uh, I'm not going to tell you the title. Just Google uh, Mary Elizabeth Croft because I don't remember the title to it. How I clobbered every cash confiscatory. She can't find a publisher because of the title. 
folks. We also have some other people here. We've got uh, uh, Reverend Belanger back there. Let's have a round of applause for him. <laughs> Mr. Gordon Schiller is in the audience. He says, uh, or actually, he didn't even pull me over. I was pu pulled over the side of the road dropping somebody off at the bus stop, and this cop drives by me. And then he stops and flicks on his cherries and backs up. And, and I'm sitting at the bus stop, and I'm like, what did I do? I'm not even moving here. So he comes up to the window and says whatever, and I'm like, what did I do? And he's like, uh, I need to see some ID. Well, what did I do? And then he steps back, and he gets all puffy, and he's like this, and he says, uh, I need to see some ID. And so this is all kind of new to me, and I'm not really going to push it. My wife and child are in the car. And so I'm like, all right, all right, all right. So I pull out my driver's license, and I give it to him. And he's like, I'm going to have to ask you to step out of the car. And we go through the whole rigmarole. And so I'm like, what's going on? Well, you got some outstanding parking tickets. And I'm like, well, these aren't even criminal offenses. Why am I getting arrested? And you know where I live. So what's all this about? Well, whatever. we got to get you to sign this promise to appear and whatever. And I'm like, well, what if I don't sign it? What happens? And he says, uh, well, then you go to jail. So my wife at the time is from the States, and she hadn't got her driver's license and all that stuff. So I'm like, well, I can't leave my child stranded at the side, and my wife stranded at the side of the road, so I'll sign the, sign the paper. So I sign it, and I sign it under duress, and, and uh, that's fine. They let me go, and I go home. So anyway, that, that's that. And then, uh, so I have to go to court. I've got this court date. So we go into court, and I, and I took... And Rob came with me, and he was acting as my agent. So we walk in the courtroom, and the uh, prosecutor stands up when she hears Rob say his name. We don't want Mr. Menard in here. So I'm, I'm like, well, that's interesting. So <clears throat> this goes on for like a year and a half. Nine months of the time, she's trying to get Rob to not be my agent. Uh, so then we ask a constitutional question. One of the thing was, uh, one of the questions in it was basically, you know, can a, can a cop use a child as ransom to, to get a signed security interest? And, uh, you know, we thought it was a pretty straightforward question. I mean, what's the answer to that? Obviously, they can't do that. But anyway, so we got no reply, or we got a reply, actually, and that's in the book. We got a reply from one of the attorney generals or somebody, and, uh, and uh, so saying that we're not going to come and do anything with this. So, so as it turns out, we end up going to provincial court because we were in traffic court in front of a JP. You go to provincial court for a constitutional question. So... We get in front of the judge, and right away the prosecutor stands up. We're not letting Mr. Menard be the, we don't want him to be the agent. We don't want to talk to him. We don't want him in the courtroom. And uh, he, and then she said, uh, the, the JP from the other court said that he wasn't allowed to be a lawyer. He was doing all this stuff, and it, she's lying. She lied right to the court. And I turned to Rob, and I said, am I allowed to do that? And he's like, no, no, you can't do that. I'm like, well, this is ridiculous. So, so anyway, that, uh, that was the provincial court, and they end up adjourning that, and we have to come back a little while later. So uh, that was another interesting story in of itself, and that'll be in the in book that we're working on. But, um, so, so eventually we go back, and I, and I now have done all my Freeman stuff. I've sent in my notice of understanding because I've, I've learned a few things, obviously, in this thing. One, they don't follow their own rules. They want me to follow these rules, and they use all these words and stuff against me. And, um, and uh, so I'm like, well... The information presented in this video may be extremely toxic to deceptive governments and lying lawyers. It should not be viewed by anyone who is happy and comfortable with their status quo or those who think questioning the government is immoral. The information presented herein is not the legal advice of a lawyer and thus is not flavored with the stench normally associated with such words. Super concentrated truth can harm those accustomed to only lies. Any similarity between the ideas expressed herein and the wise teachings of Jesus Christ is merely due to truth being immutable and unchanging. Nothing is coincidence when the spirit is active. When those with eyes can see and hear, and those with ears can hear and see, because they are working together, the deceivers will be bound 
by their own words, and the kingdom of God is at hand. So you're a Canadian? Yep. So the new go your government generally, do you trust it? No, I never trust politicians. Do you believe that they lie to you? Uh, I think for the most part, yeah, they don't tell the truth or the full story. Do you have a driver's license? Yes. Did you read the Motor Vehicle Act before you got your license, after, or have you never even read it? Does that include the test that you take? Yeah. Your driver's test? No, just the Motor Vehicle Act. No. Never read it. What makes you think you actually need a license if you've never read that act? Good and question. you know the government lies. Good question. That's a good question. Did you register your child with the government? Yes. Did you feel that you were obliged to register your little boy? Yep. Are you aware that you... Actually, you got a beautiful little baby, actually. <laughs> this is what I found out. I've been studying the law. You're not obliged to register your child. Right. If you do, at, at that point in time, you're creating a legal entity just like any of these businesses. You're associating that legal entity with your offspring, and then you abandon ownership of it. The government seizes it under the laws of maritime salvage. It becomes their chattel property. When they come to remove a child, they're not removing the living, breathing human being. They're acting on that legal entity, and you can disassociate it at any time. Do you think that's a little bit sneaky on their part? I think governments are always sneaky. You know what my question is? It takes seven years or ten years to become a doctor. It takes takes the same amount to become a lawyer. You want to be a scientist, you have to go to university. You want to become an electrician, you have to do electrical training and you have to do on-the-job training. What do you have to do to become a politician? That's my question for you. What's your One more, then I go. Got any papers? It's always nice to have a sense of humor. Oh, that's very important, I thought. It is very important. Yeah. Peace to you guys. Thanks, have a good night. All right, that's right. They didn't have any papers. Papers? Papers. Rob Christie. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is only my second or third time doing this, so bear with me. Uh, anyway, uh, I met uh, my brother Freeman Menard through my friend Clint here. I actually met them both the same day, so uh, it was quite a, quite a change in my life. Um, I was already kind of down this path uh, through health and spirituality and stuff, trying to kind of find out what what was bugging me my whole life, you know, or is you're angry or this and you're that, and it's like, well, there's something there that's really bugging me, I don't know what it is. So I tried the spiritual stuff, and there's lots of answers in there, I got lots of the pieces of the puzzle and the health stuff, and that's that was good too, but there was still something that was missing. So I met uh, uh, Clint and, and Rob, and uh, <clears throat> started to hear what Rob had to say, I'd gone into the natural person stuff, and I'd, I'd you know, listened to some other stuff, and and I wanted to uh, to thank everybody who has come before us and and done a lot, of, paved a lot of this road for us, because uh, they've been trudging through the muck for a long time. So, so a lot of honor to those people. Um, so anyway, I uh, I met Rob, and uh, he started to tell me some of the stuff that you know he was that he'd found out, and um, so I figured, well, I need to kind of prove this somehow and I, I need to make it work for me I gotta see how this works so looking at the whole thing I was like well parking tickets parking tickets are uh, not criminal and um, you can kind of you know see what's gonna happen with parking tickets and there's really no consequence other than money at the end of the day so so I uh, <clears throat> started to get parking tickets and uh, I got a few parking tickets and uh, we responded it we initially responded by uh, conditionally accepting saying you know we, we accept this uh, but in order for me to administrate this uh, I need a I need a bill and because uh, according to their rules they have the bills of exchange act and they have rules and they're supposed to follow them so uh, I'm thinking to myself well if I'm gonna play the game and I'm gonna be in here and they want me to follow the rules well I'm gonna have to well, I'm gonna hold them to it anyway I, I can't be the only guy playing by the rules 
So anyway, we look on these parking tickets. The first one, they uh, they they gave me a, I can't remember what they called it, but they let the first one go. They were like, we'll let that one go, kind of a thing. But I kept getting parking tickets, and they towed my car. And, and, uh, then, and then one day, uh, I got pulled over. It was 11 o'clock at night, and, they, and the guy pulled me over, and uh, and I was with my wife and, and small child, and and they and the guy pulls me over, and he... Training do you have to have? You have to have a big mouth. That's it. Right? Uh-oh, he's right. We're in trouble. Thank you for your time. Yeah. But this really seems to me like a spectacle, right? I mean, you've already dragged somebody away, but now there's this presence, right? This going to shut the whole street down. I live on the other side, and i got to walk blocks around to get through. Stick around, because we're going to be breaking... I know, but I don't understand why you've been here for hours. I know. Can I borrow a couple of these barriers? I think they could be very... You're supposed to have a red light that goes on here. That is not working. Maybe my battery's dead. Let me have a look and see. No. What are for? It doesn't work. It doesn't? Can I ask you a question on camera? Anyways, two quick questions. One. I can't believe you've been holding that up for a while. Fairweather. How come some of you guys have numbers? Yeah, Other of you have, have, fair weather. have, have really your names? Fair weather. This is my community service. This is no, but that's a good I, I no, How come some of you have, have the names? Is, the only one that some, has name is it because some are numbers. acting as peace officers and others are acting as law enforcement officers? Well, is that the reason? Okay, I don't talk to that. 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 I don't talk to that because it doesn't work. Put it down. Put it down. If it's not working, why not talk to it? Put it down. Rest your arm. Okay. That is a good one, too. It's simply up to my badge number is 1090. Um, officers, certain officers want the number. I always, oh yeah, I know absolutely. You have to be identifiable either by a number or name. I always want people to see my name. Because there's only one in It's a powerful name. So that's up to each officer's discretion whether that. That's what he said. <laughs> okay, one more quick question. I am, I am a people person. I have been around for 24 years. I, I play numbers. I don't think anybody else can do what they do, but I want to be known. I'm not by constable or sergeant. Can I ask one more quick question? One more very quick question. Statutes. Do they have the force of law over those who deny consent to be governed? Statutes? The statutes. Does a statute like the Controlled Drugs and Substance Act, does it have the force of law over those who have denied consent to be governed? Sorry, I'm losing. You lose me on that one because uh, I started work at 5 this morning and uh, that question's going to I'll try one more time. Can I try one more time? No. No? No, I don't want to play. Oh, okay. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Why? Because I've got a Sony millimeter too, and that one doesn't work. Really? Your, yours doesn't work, or this one? You should look at the menu. You'll find you got you got an option to turn that red light off or on, eh? You got to go to menu though. stand on that side of the line? We let you guys cross to our side. Fair is fair. Later. Anyway, so everything.